Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the competitive Worms Armageddon podcast, episode two, featuring the one and only legendary Dead Code. We also have Ma Black here. Hello. What's up? Yeah, so exciting stuff here. Um, so what we're going to do is we take you through a bunch of news we've got for leagues and stuff, and then we've got like a few clips. And then at 8pm GMT, we will have an interview with Dead Code. So if you have any questions you would like to ask Dead Code, write them down and you can ask them later on in the episode. So um, let's kick things off here with the news here. So we're just going to go through TUS, um, Chaos League, ONL, and most of the, the league stuff as this is competitive. So we'll start with Cups. So on TUS Cups, we have a renaissance of Rope and Cup beginning on April the 1st with some cash prizes, which consists of five roping schemes, Big Rope Race, Tower Race, Time Trial Rope Race, Last car and WXW wall to wall. Um, Do people still play last cars? Yeah, it's nice. That's <laughs> so challenges. Uh, there's been quite a few records and challenges. Um, Lupastic won the Jetpack Race Challenge Week Ten with a score of three hundred and fifty-one points. Second place was SSM with four hundred and ninety-five points. And Danger was third with 580 points. I won the NDSC 37 darts challenge with a perfect score of 120 out of 120. Triad in second place with 117 out of 120. And Sniper in third place with 111 out of 120. Gabrielle won the Boom Race Challenge week three with a time of 55.42 seconds, and you'll see that fairly shortly. The Walrus in second with 88.6, and Triad in third with 100.74. Lupastic also won the TRC number eight Girder Driver Challenge with a time of 235.48 seconds. Second place, Kirill, with 579.12. And third was Danger, with 707.56. Gabriel also won the Jetpack Race Challenge Week 9, with a time of 83.68. And second was Lupastic, with 86.98. So that was very close just a few seconds, and Stackett picking up third with 101.4. Sid won the Darts Forts Challenge with an eight-turn record, which is one turn short of a perfect record. Triad was second with a 12-turner, and Danger won 3-5 with 40 turns. So, looking at ONL... Um, the season statistics so far. So that's the only normal league, if, if, you're, if you're wondering, which is the intermediate scheme. Rafka is in first place with 16.44 points. He's won 27 out of 28 games. Very impressive. Kinslayer in second place with 15.64 points with 17 games won and one loss. And Ivan in third place with 13.6 points and 57 games won, 9 games lost. And then from 4th to 8th is Pan Surman, Solanio, Perdinok, Chuvash and Terror. So that's how things are looking on ONL. So now we're getting to the TUS um, league statistics. So for... Season 29, which is the current season in all round, Blitzed is in first place with 62 played, 44 wins, 18 games lost. Lupastic in second place with 33 games played, 18 games won and 15 games lost. Walrus in third place with 27 games played, 16 wins and 11 losses. And then from fourth to eighth, you have three Rafka, Stackett, and Rocket, and Kirill 470. So now we are going to move on to the playoffs. And 
you're going to see the on the screen here. So for season 25, because we actually have four seasons to cover here. So season 25, Blitzed beat Style in the semi-finals and he will face Kalu in the grand final. He beat Sock to reach that. So season 26, we have Old Sock and Dead Code to play in the semi-final and Camper beat Rafka, so the winner of Sock and Dead Code will play Camper. For season 27, Blitzed versus Camper, so Blitzed won that, and Rafka versus Free, Free won that, so now those two are in the grand final, awaiting that match to be played. Season 27, Blitzed versus Walrus for... Sorry, season 28, Blitzed versus Walrus in the semi-final and Free versus Baffle in the semi-final. That will be a really, really good one. For Clanners in season 28, we have Mad Villains versus the Deadly Clan in the semi-finals and In Cold Blood against Supremo Tribunal Federal in the semi-finals. So looking at the clanners, um, MV were first place, STF were second, ICB were third, and TDC were fourth. Moving on to TUS Team 17 week, in the season seven playoffs, we have Dead Code versus Chicken 2 Free for the semi final, and Korean Red Dragon versus Senator for the semi final for. Incredibly good player. Senator has already won three playoffs, so this would be amazing if he could win another one. And yeah, this is going to be a really good set of playoffs anyway. Um, looking yeah. at... Sorry, what was that, my black? Oh, I was going to say, like, Team 17 is really competitive right now. Like, oh, it, yeah. It's like a lot what? of people are just like, that's, that's where the game's at. It's actually one of the most um, competitive schemes there is right now, one of the most played. I would probably say Intermediate, Team 17 and Chaos League are probably the most competitive leagues. Um, but also there's actually a lot of competition going on in Cups, which we will be getting to actually right now. Um, so the Academy of Artillery number two... Uh, recently finished um tita beat the walrus in the grand final three to one um rocket beat sensei in the grand final three games to one and as you can see there in order to get to the final tita beat ladan and sensei and then the walrus and rocket beat zvitter the walrus to get to the Oh no, sorry, the Walrus one that I'm being an idiot. So Rocket beats Vitter, lost against Walrus, and then beats Sensei in the semi-final. For Snipers Bungie Race Cup, um, it was actually myself who won that against Free in the final, 2-0. And Sniper beat Triad um, in the bronze match. And I know it says the Karen right now, but that's, that's just a little joke. <laughs> Um, so in the unlucky strike cup again Lupastic winning more things he was in the final with uh, Zalo the Molar and managed to beat Zalo the Molar um, I can't remember the score I think it was 3-1 or 3-2 or something but yeah good match there um, so congratulations to him and yeah uh, Mega Adnan beating Yego there so now we're going to move over to my black who's going to give us a rundown of the chaos league and you've got five minutes my black okay so uh yeah chaos league at chaosleague.com k-a-o-s uh there have been a lot of exciting games lately um a lot of uh league games there's pretty much always a league going on and a, a cup going on and it's mostly like just like the top of the top all playing each other um if we get more players we'll probably have a, a separate league but um yeah so lately some of the latest matches we've had some like really close ones recently master beat abe god 3-2 um we have abe god scored a victory over mega adnan 3-1 um just this last week yego beat 
Old Sock, a.k.a. Sock 3-0. And then we had another super, super exciting close one between Ape God and Kays. Um, and Ape God managed to eke out a victory 3-2. Uh, and beating Kays at all right now is, like, insanely hard. <laughs> so props to him. And we also had Winkat beating uh, Lack Lack 3-1. Dream beating Hal 9000 3-1. And... Uh, Let's see, I beat uh, St. Jimmy 3-1 earlier this week. Um, and yeah, those are some of the most recent games. So looking at the standings right now, so we have Master in first. So the top three, all like super, super close. So Master is in first with 16 wins. Case is in second with 16 wins. Abe God is in third with 16 wins. Uh, I'm at fourth with... Uh, 14 wins, then Diego has uh, 12 victories, Dream has 11, Mega Adnan has 8, Winkat has 8, Lacklack has 6, St. Jimmy has 5, Hal 9000 has 5, Danny has 3, Ultok has 1, and um, again, everyone in this league is just like insanely good, so this is like, it's hard to get like any victories at all here. And... um. Yeah, so Master has uh, pulled into first. So Case is typically always in first place, both in leagues and the cup so far. Um, so this is the first time that someone has gotten ahead of him a little bit, but it's still like really, really close. Like if we look at like the total number of rounds won, Master has like 42 rounds won, Case has like 37, uh, but same number of victories. So. Um, it's really competitive over there. I would encourage anybody who's interested in chaos to just come play with us. There's, it's like learning a whole new game, since uh, weapons don't end your turn. It's, uh, it's, it's chaotic and fun. It is a, it's a very different way of seeing the game played as well. I really admire the combinations that you get people pulling off. Um, it's just that adaptability, whatever weapons you get, and pulling off different combinations. And uh, we've actually got a really nice turn coming up in the competitive footage section, which will be coming up in a few minutes. Um, so you're going to see some really nice shots there as well. Oh, yeah. There's like there's a million different combos you can do with different weapons. Uh, it just changes your your whole perception. And it's kind of like if uh, Intermediate is more like chess, Chaos is more like Blitz chess. You're never going to like get things perfect, but you can get better and better at it. It's really fun. Is that is that you finished with the Chaos League stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. Do we have uh, another minute or two? Yeah, we've still got another. We're a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, we're two okay, minutes so left. Let's look at the let's look at the crate speed average of each of the players. Um, so crate speed sort of tells you how good someone is at collecting crates, and we actually don't really know for sure what the optimal you know crate speed is. But what we're seeing at the top is most people are getting between like four and five crates per minute, and uh, if you play a chaos match, that usually adds up to like a hundred crates over twenty minutes, something like that. Um, that's usually like a good rate of collection. And uh, in the games we actually have, there's a little crate counter that you can see in the lower left. Um, and it, it doesn't really like guarantee that like you're playing super well, but it's a, it's an interesting indicator because we sort of see uh, as the numbers go from top to bottom. So like Master has 4.4 crates per minute, Case has 4.6 crates per minute, Abe God has 4.4, I have 4. Diego has 4.4, and then it, it kind of gets a little bit lower as you go down, so um, it sort of tells you that, like, there's a certain level of uh, of crate collection that can ensure you're, like, you're on the right track, I guess. Right, my Black, thanks for that, and we will move on to the next section. So, until... For the next half an hour, there's um, just some leak footage, some nice shots, uh, and a couple of tutorials by Mablack and myself. So, we're going to switch over here, and yeah, um, enjoy these videos. So, first off, there's the competitive footage from March. That's ev that's some a collection of nice shots from the leagues and cups, etc., and challenges from 
March 2024. So yeah, enjoy and we'll see you soon.
Hello, and a good day to you. Worms Armageddon has seen a very welcome increase in activity recently. We've actually had one of the most active TUS Singles League seasons since Season 1. With this activity, one of my most favourite schemes, B&G, has also seen some new life as well. I've even had some requests recently to make a guide on how to make a good B&G map. So here it is, the You Can Hide But You Can't Run B&G Map tutorial. The most basic way to create a BNG map is to use the classic Team 17 Double Tunnel Cavern map located on the bottom, second from the left, right click, select the flood tool, delete the top, select the flood tool again, fill the bottom and then that's it. That's your basic BNG map. You can preview the terrain by left clicking the preview terrain button. 
Now, you might see that it's a little bit basic, so if you want to make it a little bit more complex, all you need to do is increase the number of objects on the terrain and make sure girders are set as low as possible. And with this, you'll see that there are a lot more places to hide, so that's the most basic way to make a BNG map, and that's quite suitable for most people, especially those just starting to learn BNG. You don't really need anything more advanced until you're a more advanced player. However, if you're not happy with the placement of objects, just hit the reseed button and it will spawn a new set of objects on the map randomly. This one looks quite nice so it would be good for a beginner. You can also change the terrain which cycles through different terrains and object types. My personal favourites are fruit, desert, tentacles, tribal and minus forest. Now you should be familiar with the basics of making a BNG map. Moving on to a slightly more advanced method of creating BNG maps, for those with a little more experience in BNG using the editing tools located on the left side here. Repeat the steps of the basic guide, pick a map at the bottom, delete the top, fill in the bottom, and this is where you will use just the default brush size, which is number 4, as you can see on the left. Now, you can do this however you want, but this is how I do it for good TUS BNG maps with challenging hides for more advanced players. Flatten out the map a little bit, make sure the edges are sticking inwards for an extra hide on the edge of the map, then you can alternate by putting diagonal and vertical lines which create extra trenches for the worms to hide in. Nothing too complex yet, a quick and easy method to create a nice TUS League style BNG map. Remember you can also use the reseed button to spawn new objects until you get something you like. You can also hold down the shift button and left click to go back to a previous reseed just in case you skipped past one that looked good. Also, remember you can change the terrain type as well. Now, one of the most complex methods of making a really good BNG map with lots of variating hides which work with pretty much any type of terrain is as follows. So you repeat the basic steps, but this time we're going to go into extra detail. Pay attention and stay with me as I focus on designing a very complex map from scratch. As I continue to edit the map, you will see various parts of the map being filled and deleted to create places for the objects to spawn and trenches for the worms to hide in. Then, when you're really happy with the basic design, you can start browsing for a nice terrain type for the map. So I like this, but it covers up certain parts I'm not happy with, so I'll keep browsing different terrains until I find something that leaves open most of the trenches but placing nice objects. I really like this one, so let's use this one and fine tune it. Now, this is the most advanced and challenging part and can take a little bit of time to get right. Practice makes perfect though. During this part of the process, you need to constantly switch between preview and edit modes and be very careful with what you're doing. Once you're at this stage and ready to begin, you will need to switch often between different brush sizes. Using smaller dots and strokes to create extra platforms for worms to stand on and reinforce certain positions from being opened too easily.
Now, don't be worried if you make a mistake and your objects change, which affects the entire map and object placement. You can always use the undo button to go back, then carefully adjust the dot or the stroke so that it doesn't change the object placements. The general idea here is to try and make an even number of hides on both sides or as many hides on both sides as possible. This way the map is not only suitable for 1 versus 1 but also 2 versus 2 and 3 versus 3 which is great for clanners as well as playing with your friends. And there you go, a very good PNG map with a lot of height and shot variation for the most advanced players. Now it's time to save your map. I'm going to save this as I'm almost ready to release a BNG map pack. It's great to have these types of BNG map packs as you can load up the map and then use the knowledge you've learned to remix the map change the terrain, change the seed, quickly delete and draw different hides and objects to make fresh BNG maps very quickly. As you can see here, I'm just following all the steps that we previously discussed in the tutorial to remove parts, delete parts, add dots, delete dots, keep checking the preview of the map until we get a really nice map. When playing league matches, try not to use the same map twice without editing it, as it's not nice to use the same map over and over again, as once you've learned what shots to use in each position, you've got an unfair advantage against other players who haven't played that map yet. Also, it's good to note that you do not need to do everything exactly the same way I did it. You can be creative and make your own style. So yeah, when you have your own map pack, just load up a map, reseed it, Follow the previous steps and with a bit of practice, you'll be making epic BNG maps in no time. Right folks, that's your now you can hide but you can't run BNG map making tutorial. So yeah, good luck with BNG and I hope to see all you beautiful BNG players sometime soon on the battlefield. So you made a wrong turn looking for the local Panera Bread. And now you're here at the Worms Armageddon All Missions Any% Percent Speedrun Tutorial Series. That means you'll be learning to do the basic training followed by 33 missions with me, Mablack, as your tour guide. <clears throat> the current record holder for All Missions Any% Percent. Just need you to sign this waiver exempting me from liability for bungee related PTSD and we're good to go. And first, let's check out a couple things in the options menu. You want to pick a resolution that works for you. I find 1280 by 720 to be great for streaming. If you go too much higher than that, you run the risk of the worms looking really small on the screen, which is not a great time. Under advanced, if you find the front end is slow or laggy, you can select this option. Timer workaround, you want to leave that unchecked. Graphics, this is just whether you're using the GPU, shader, or the CPU. This option tends to be the best one as far as I know in most cases, and you want to stream and record the game in windowed mode. It's way more optimized for that stuff, and you want to uncheck these two vertical sync options. That's going to give you the fastest loading time, as far as I know. There's some more options here, I'm not going to go into everything, and let's get on to the training. So we select the single player menu, training disciples, you want to create a team, and just load it in. 
And at this point, I should mention that the Worms Armageddon in all missions, any percent run, does have an auto splitter that will automatically do the splits between training and each mission for you. So I have a link to that in the description. It's great. You don't want to click on begin training with the mouse. You just want to press tab two times and then mash space. And then between each training section, you can just mash space to get to the next one. So tab twice and then mash space. The first training is grenade training, and this one's super easy. We just have to hit two targets that appear one at a time. You want to press insert as many times as you need to to get the background you want. I think the black background is way less distracting for training. There's only one set of waves. And a cool thing about Worms Armageddon, you can buffer up to three buttons before the turn starts. So if you want to fire that grenade immediately and get the fastest turn possible, just hold space before the turn starts, and also one to make the fuse on the grenade one second, which is what we need. So if you hold one and space, and then adjust with up, our first turn looks like this. Okay, that's literally the first training section. Let's recap that real quick. So on this first angle, you want to get to roughly the same angle every time. One great way to remember this power, so look at the power bar, and it is just barely touching that crosshair. So if you get to that same power every time, that's a great way to just make this consistent and reliable. The angle, you just have to sort of go by feel and you know do this a number of times, but the power, you can get it the same every time. And then immediately, while that shot is still in the air, you want to do a full power shot. So in Worms Armageddon, a full power shot, if you just keep holding space, it'll eventually max out the power and release with that same power every time. And you just want to aim a, a little bit higher than that first shot. Okay, and while we're here, let's cover Fade Skip. So for both the training and all the missions, anytime the screen starts to fade to black, you can press Alt F4, and that's going to take you to the next mission. So if I press Alt F4 right now, then it'll say that was a success and I can go on to the next mission. So the strat here, you press Alt F4 the moment you see the screen dim at all, then just mash space to get to the next either training or mission. And this is just sort of a thing that they put in, I think, as a, a safeguard. If you quit the mission early after beating it, they want you to still have beaten it. So kind of a cool shortcut. Okay, after pressing Alt F4 and mashing space, we're on to part two, shotgun training. So you just have to shoot a bunch of targets that appear one at a time with shotgun. So they will appear in the same order every time. So first off, just face right, aim up a little bit. And this is another case where you can hold right before the turn even starts and space. And what I like to do here is just walk a little bit left, not quite to the edge of the platform. Aim down, hit that one, immediately aim to the right, shoot that target, and that target can be a little bit difficult, it may take more than one shot, but luckily you have infinite shots here. Okay, then we have another one to the left, and then for the final target, just to save a little time, instead of walking to the right of this platform and then shooting down, you can actually shoot through this platform first, and then shoot down. So that can save a little bit of time. Let's just look at that one more time. So we have the right target, lower left target, far right target, upper left target, far left target, target that we shoot through the terrain to get to. Part three of basic training is bazooka training, and we just have to zook two targets. So bazooka is one of the few weapons in the game that's affected by wind. We have this wind bar in the lower right corner. And we're always going to have four power wind facing to the left every time on this training. So you want to aim almost directly at the target, just a bit up and do a full power shot. Then immediately aim up. And you can actually press space the moment you start aiming up. I waited a little on this one just for better control. Up to you. And the power on this one, it's roughly halfway between your worm and the crosshair. Um, you just want to practice it a bunch to get a good feel for it to hit that second target. Then once again, it fades to black the moment it starts to fade. Alt F4 and mash space. 
Training four is rope practice. We want to swing over to this crate using ninja rope, collect it, it contains a baseball bat. We land over near the target and then baseball bat the target. So if you've never used ninja rope before, one way to build up speed, you wanna attach it, then hold up and right. That's gonna build up a lot of speed. You don't really need to hold it the whole time. On this one, you don't really need to go full speed as you collect the crate. You kinda wanna go a little bit slow just to make sure you grab it. So I give myself a little bit of time before I start holding up and right. I don't hold it the whole way, just like going for max speed here. Grab the crate, do just a couple more swings and just land gently over here. Press F7 to select bat and just bat the target. Part five is grenade training too. You'll notice it's the same grenade training as before. They just add an extra target. So you can do the first two shots just the same way as before. For the first one, the power bar goes roughly to the edge of the crosshair. It's a one second fuse. The next one is a full power shot. Now for the third shot, you can actually remember this angle and also the power, roughly speaking. So the angle, if you look at the angle of the crosshair, imagine if the angle was a perfect X, so like, you know, a perfect 45 degree angle, so that the crosshair is sort of parallel to the ground. It's making an X that's parallel to the ground, you know, like the, the girder that the worm is standing on. Well, you just want to go a little bit up of that, just a little bit up from there. And as for the power, the power bar just needs to be roughly halfway between the edge of the crosshair and the middle white dot of the crosshair. And it's a two second fuse. That's gonna get you a pretty solid shot on that last target. Training part six is fire punch training. For this one, we have one fire punch. We need to collect that crate, which contains two fire punches, then use those to destroy the targets. So immediately do two forward jumps then we backflip and you want to do a fire punch in midair. You don't want to do it at the very top of your jump because if you do that, you'll actually go too high. Then you'll take fall damage and buoying yourself, which is not good. So do it a little before you reach the top of your jump. Okay, then walk a little left, forward jump, walk a little left, forward jump again, and then fire punch in midair. And once again, walk a little bit to the left, forward jump again, and fire punch in midair again. And that's it. Part seven, rope training two. We just have to collect that crate containing a dynamite, then rope over to the target, lay the dynamite, and then rope to safety. So we shoot rope to the left, and you can grab that crate in just one rope. Shoot about there, and I'm pulling in with up and left. Then I'm just extending with down and left. Then I'm holding up and right, and I just do one fling. Just need one fling, attach there, extend a little bit with down and right, and then just press enter. Then all you have to do is swing over to the middle girder and you're done. Part 8, Bazooka Training 2. For this one, we have four targets we need to hit. For that first target, you can just hold space immediately before your turn even starts. Aim up, you can just aim straight at it, and we'll have the same wind every time. For this one, you're just aiming a bit above the target, not quite in a straight line. And this one, this is much like the previous shot. So you want to do a pretty small amount of power, just get a good feel for it by practicing it. And then for this final target, you can actually start shooting the moment that that previous Zook is in the air. So for this shot, I actually did two skips. If you aim a little bit higher, you'll get one skip, and that is just a little bit faster. So I could actually aim this a little bit higher, but you do have a huge margin for error for this final shot. This is just showcasing the bazooka's awesome ability to skip over water. Let's recap that real quick. Part 9, Grenade Training 3. This is the final part of basic training, and it's a tough one. For this one, we have the same three targets as before for Grenade, just to start off with, except the first two are in reverse order. 
So we do that full power shot with a one second fuse. Then we do that other shot where the power bar goes roughly to the edge of the crosshair. And for this one, we want to make sure we get that perfect X with the crosshair, so roughly 45 degrees or a little bit above. And we want to have that power bar go roughly past the edge of the crosshair, not quite hitting the center of it in the two second fuse. And then we have a target that's going to spawn at the far right. This last shot got a lot easier thanks to an observation made by Hollow. He told me, uh, you can just do a full power shot here something I didn't know for literally years. So we have two angles where this shot works, and it's a full power two second shot. It's this angle or one angle below it. So what you'll notice is that the shape of the crosshair is sort of like a pinwheel or a shuriken. So all four nubs are right angles. They're very pointy. So take a look at this, uh, this close up of that. Now you might not get it the first time. That's okay with practice you'll get a lot better at it. And since there's two angles where this works, there's a lot of wiggle room. All right, now let's bring it all together. So we have that first full power one second shot, the lighter one second power shot, that above 45 degree two second shot, and then the full power shot. I didn't get it my first try. You can adjust as you go. And then I got it, and then the final one second shot, and that's it. Now from here, you want to press space just once. You don't want to overpress it. You might restart the basic training. Exit. Go to attempt mission. Load your team that you just used. Then press tab three times to start mission one. And then just mash space. And from then on out, anytime you go between missions, you can just mash space to get to the next mission. I'm going to be releasing tutorial videos on all the missions over the next little while, so stay tuned. But if you're chomping at the bit, you just can't wait to get this speedrun underway, check out the Worms Armageddon All Missions Speedrun Notes. This is a huge document written by Ruffled Bricks that just compiles all our modern methods. It's basically up to date, and there might be a few methods that I do a little bit differently, and that's one reason I'm doing the tutorial series, just to kind of explain the exact way that I do the speed run, and hopefully it's approachable for anybody who's taking this thing on. But yeah, definitely check this thing out. There will be a link in the video description. Right, uh, I hope you all enjoyed those videos. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look through a replay and do some analysis of a recent clanner match between ICB and TDC. My Black is going to do most of, or if not all of the talking, and I'm going to sit back and do some of the doodling. Take it away, My Black. All right. So yeah, we have this uh, recent match. It's uh, an elite between uh, the clans TDC and ICB. Yes, so we have uh, Old Sock and Rocket and ICB in blue. And TDC, we got... Uh, we have Peja and Senator, two great players, in red. So I'm just going to kind of give my impressions on like, okay, are their hides good? Uh, are there any improvements they could make? Not that these players need any tips or anything. This is more just like, okay, how can we optimize our play here? So placement is a really big part of Elite. It's a really fast-paced game. Um, and placement can really determine whether you're going to be able to get a skunk off or not. So skunks are a huge part of Elite. If you can get a double skunk on your opponents, like the game is practically yours. Um, uh, or a triple skunk basically means it's game over. You can just wait it out, let them, let their health get to zero. So this time we have kind of a situation where blue is kind of taking the left side. And red is kind of taking the right side a little bit. So we sort of have three red worms more on the right side. So um, the right side is becoming red's sort of zone. But they have one invader worm on the left that has the ability to do a skunk on potentially booty and needle. And that's always a good strategy. So like you can make your second or third worm sort of in the opponent's zone. So that's always uh, that's good placement on that worm McKinnon there. These upper left worms uh, by blue, 
So ICB, they're a little bit open. So like, what I would say is, um, I think these worms need hides. And okay, this is a really great grenade shot. As great as that shot was, I would say that worm needs to torch in. So you see that spot where like, the skull has the mine on it. You could go beneath that, torch to the right. That would be an amazing hide. And you could continue to BNG from there. The problem is this worm on the left is open. And yeah, they're already they're already taking a homing missile to it. So that's a real problem, because this worm's gonna get like pelted. So as annoying as it is, I would say like, yeah, you wanna hide first. You give yourself a really good hide. If you're going the B and G route, just tossing grenades at the opponent. Um it's good to formulate a plan that doesn't rely too much on BNG. Sometimes you have no choice, though. But yeah, I mean, like, if you torched in there, that would be, like, a great hide. So it is good that they can finish this worm off. Um, it's good, if possible, to get ahead in worm count. Just make sure that your opponent can't do uh, turn abuse on you. Or if they have one less worm than you, they just uh, pile next to the worm that just went, and then they'll be able to get that turn before that worm goes again. So here we have the setup for the skunk. So this worm is actually in the perfect spot to do a skunk. Um, so it looks like Booty really shouldn't have hidden there, because like you, you want to do everything you can to avoid a double skunk. Uh, yeah, and this is... This is uh, I feel like that was pretty well executed. Maybe stand a little further to the right so you can be sure the skunk doesn't like hit you, but yeah. Um, and maybe a little, it's a little hard to tell if the skunk is going to bounce over, but it seems reasonably likely. So that was a really good skunk. And with two arms skunked, you are like, kind of screwed. Um, you have to either counter skunk the opponents, or sometimes you're able to play the game fast enough that your poison, the fact that your poison doesn't matter, but... Yeah, in this case, I would say, like, okay, you need, maybe you can kill Saku on top before he gets, um, a good hide. Do something, because, like, you're, you're in serious danger, right? So, on the right, we have, um, yeah, ICB. That worm on the right is not the best invader worm. It's not really able to do anything right now. Um, that worm really needs to get freed up. I would say, like, in that lower right, that breathe worm. Maybe teleport it, because, like, you only... It's going to be your only healthy worm, basically. <laughs> like, you, you probably... I would teleport... Like, honestly, um, I would consider just the far left. Like, because there's just not... So if you teleport to that far left area, you will be able to connect with a torch eventually. But you mainly just want to preserve that worm's health, because there's, like... There's, like, no other way to do that. Anywhere else you teleport, that worm's going to get attacked. And they're going to be gunning for your healthiest worm. So we have this worm again. He's, so, firing PNG, but he still doesn't have that hide. That's, like, a, a problem. I would say, like, you know. Once again, just, just get yourself a hide first. Because that worm could still have, like, 100 health if it got that hide. But these upper right red worms, um... They are healthy. They could also use a hide. <laughs> like, okay, this wor this worm is getting to a hide. Let's try to think. What's the best hide? Because you could make you could torch in like this. You could make a girder. This gives you a lot more land. Oh, okay. So this hide is um. I think this would be fine. I would say don't connect the two worms, because you can- this worm right now can send a skunk into the place where Saku is, and just have the skunk, like, uh, hit Saku from the left side, then it's gonna bounce out, and it could very well get a double on Ollie. That would be one way to do a double skunk here. If you're sending this worm to a bait, um... It's good to remember that worm's gonna die. So like this is a suicide mission for that worm booty. So I would say like 100% do a skunk. Eventually that's gonna kill, basically kill at least one worm. And you would have a chance for, uh, for two as well. Okay, and now TDC. 
Yeah, going for the healthy worm. That's important to remember. Even though that worm needle was right there, you want to take out the healthiest worms you can because these poison worms are going to be like just one health soon enough. So um, that makes sense to you. So in Elite, you only get two ropes. That's important to remember. So typically you want to save them for two moves that are decisive that you know are going to like be crucial to like getting you to win. I had to take out that worm Ollie. You basically got to take out worms when you can for the most part. It's really important to maintain like a worm count lead if you can. But um, yeah, as you do maintain a, a, a lead in your worm count, you do want to make sure that the opponent doesn't get turn abuse on you. So typically you want your worms to be on the same side. So right now the blue worms are disconnected. Well, both teams have worms that are disconnected uh, at the moment. Typically you don't want that. So like if you have, um, yeah, if you have two worms left, a lot of times you want them to be like um, within range of each other. Or have your own little fort somewhere so that like if someone invades, you can just, you'll have backup for multiple turns in a row. Now this move, so this worm has one health, and there's not a lot it can do. It could still launch off a skunk. That would not be bad at all, like a skunk on Saku. The end result of that would be eventually Saku has one health. That worm on the left, McKinnon, might stay with 50 health. But that wouldn't be bad. That would be a way to come back. It would take a while, but, I mean, you could do it. You, you, that worm breathe would basically just have to, um... Avoid getting hit for a while. Yeah, that was a bad sheep. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was unfortunate. I mean, that's... Yeah, I'm sure that's a... That's kind of a fluke. I'm sure they would typically get that off. Um... Yeah, the sheep was... <laughs> but yeah, it's like your worm was probably going to die there, even if the sheep did go off. You could just do, like, a suicide sheep, sort of, uh... All right, so at this point, uh, we got ICB. They have one rope left, and both teams have a super sheep. That's typically the super weapon that we pick for um, for elite. It just gives you a lot, a lot better range. You're able to attack worms from across the map. And so here we have that turn abuse. He's uh, teleporting to the left, so that he's going to be close to McKinnon and can take him out before he even goes. But he didn't really get far enough to avoid getting attacked here. So this is a real problem. And attacking, they're just like, okay, let's do as much damage as possible. You only, like, super need to do 50, but it doesn't hurt to just lay a dynamite and do as much damage as you can. Just you wait. Yes, sir. So yeah, that was a problem. Basically, uh... He's down to one worm here. And in those situations, if you have like a healthy worm, you gotta make sure that worm like doesn't get hit. So I would say like in that situation, he could have actually teleported maybe lower left again. <laughs> You'd at least be like safe. Yeah, there weren't there weren't like a ton of options there, I guess, but um yeah, you need to make sure that you're protected. Because if he had teleported lower left, he could potentially super sheep kill uh, McKinnon. That would at least give him, like, a way forward. Whereas teleporting close enough to get ropes too, I think that kind of, like, dooms you. Because you're going to be under 50 health. It's going to be only one hit remaining on you. The opponent's going to have, like, too many options, basically. Because as you can see, like, this worm has 38 health now. Um, there's just not a lot it can do except, like, hold on for dear, li dear life. Oh, and, uh, so we, we just had kind of a mistake. They were trying to girder this worm. Typically accidents like that don't happen. So this was, I don't know, this was more of a, more of a gaff. All right. Oh dear. 
Okay, and so, yeah, Saku basically takes that worm out with Super Sheep. I don't even know if they needed Super Sheep to get the kill. Um, they might have been able to do it without it, but... Yeah, that's that just shows the importance of, like, if you're down to one worm, you got to do everything you can to keep it healthy. And, uh, yeah, just a, a nice recent clanner, showing that clanners are still alive and Elite is still alive. Not as many people are playing Elite these days, but it's a fantastic strategic scheme. Uh, it's up there with, like, Intermediate and Chaos, but it's... I don't know, it's not, it's not quite played as much as it used to be. It used to be a bit more of a mainstay. Right, um, thank you for that replay analysis. Good job. Uh, always good to hear one of the best players' views on that. And now it is 8 p.m. GMT, and this is the moment you've all been waiting for. We are going to join uh, the interview with Dead Code now. So, yeah, um, hello, Dead Code. Hello. Hi. I need to turn your volume way up, but that's better. Okay. Um, so for you for, for you at home who are watching, if you pay attention to the top left side of the screen, you're going to see... So Dead Code is well known for doing tool-assisted speedruns of the missions. And as we're doing the interview, you can watch those live. Well, not live, the pre-recording of all his mission speedruns together. So yeah, take it away, Mablack. All right. So yeah, we got the the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Dead Code himself here. Uh, we're excited to have you. And uh, yeah, we're just going to pick your brain about some stuff. Um, so people know Dead Code. He's both a player of Worms and a programmer. We're going to start with more of the like developer side of things. Um, but before that, we always have one question that we're asking everybody. How many worms have you killed? <laughs> well, <laughs> like uh, my current team says um, over 13,000, but you know, that's, uh, I have had some team file corruption and all that stuff and re remake the team file at some point. So it's probably more like 20,000. I don't know. <laughs> that's pretty good. Those are good numbers. That's a small genocide. I think that's, uh, I think that's up there. But, but if you count I mean, I would the assume... automated things that I've done, <laughs> tool assisted, it's probably uh, you, way you higher. Automated... Like if, when I do thousands of Armageddon's per second, think about oh, wow. that. Yeah. I mean, that's probably a lot more. <laughs> You've probably killed the entire population of Earth in one <laughs> at this point. So, yeah, I was just thinking okay. if anybody's killed, the most that would be dead code with tool assist. That's crazy. He's such a genocidal maniac. In his private life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Dead Code, so when did you start playing the game? And did you start with uh, Worms 1, Worms 2, or Worms Armageddon? Yeah, well, I um, played Worms 1, a demo of Worms 1, a little bit in high school. So that was mm. in the um, mid 90s. And uh, I liked it, but I never played it a lot. I mean, I played it during like lunch period with my friends on mm -hmm. one of the school computers. And I definitely liked it. Um, oh, but that's even so before then, I played um, Scorched Earth. So that's sort of, you might count that oh, as a prequel. That's a great but, game. Uh, in like 91. So that <laughs> primed me for the idea. But then when I played Worms 1, that was so much more than Scorched Earth. And I thought, wow, this, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so that I primed heard... me even more, but I didn't play it a lot. But then. Um, well, my parents got a computer from Tiny Computers, which is a UK company, and it came oh, bundled yuck. with uh, Worms Armageddon oh, really? on CD-ROM. So that, I mean, trying that CD-ROM and I was totally hooked. I mean, that, um, so I started that in October 2000, and, um, That's and I didn't start I actually... online play right away, but uh, pretty soon after that. A follow-up, um, uh, do yeah, you I'm still cool. have your original CD-ROM? I still do have it, yeah. Oh, nice. Excellent. It has like so, one band sector on it and <laughs> one of the ambient music tracks. Right. <laughs> so think, one... Oh, sorry, on you go. Oh, I think all of us have like a, a Worms Armageddon CD that yeah. like basically is just not usable. I Hold have on. like probably three. <laughs> I have... Yeah, mine, is, mine still works. Um, nice. But um, I mean, pretty early on, I think I switched to uh, emulation so that 
be faster and uh, wouldn't stress the CD. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Yeah, I think all of us. Awesome. Oh, but yeah, uh, Dave, go ahead yeah. with the next question. Yeah, I was just showing, I've still oh, got an original please. copy of Worms Armageddon there. I've also got, I actually picked up these three the last time I was down visiting Mental down in Leeds. Oh, dude, nice. So, um, nice. one, David, sorry, Dead Code, one of your first programming feats for the game was creating a program called Sur Silkworm in the early 2000s. Can you tell us about that program and how did it lead you to getting in touch with Team 17? Yeah. So, uh, just within the first year I was playing, I, um, uh, there was, uh, having to reselect the parachute every time you used it just seemed like total drudgery, and I wanted to <laughs> automate that. And um, the, the earliest versions were very simple. They, they just sent keys to the game, totally unaware of what was going on in the game. Uh, you had to tell it how many F8s you had before parachute. And so um, mm -hmm. after you'd used a rope, typically you'd accidentally use the thing the wrong way. But um, yeah, and then, um, but before long, I'd um, started reverse engineering the game and um, giving the, the tool to work better. And uh, well, at that point, I didn't think of, I didn't think of uh, automatically selecting the parachute as a cheat. I just thought it was, eliminating some drudgery um, and I yeah, was giving it to some friends and um, I mean the main ones I played team 17 was most often and uh, and I started adding more features and reverse engineering more of the game to get those to work well I um, had it added an auto aimer um, I remember it that really something interesting to do and uh, it did not do brute force search of all the possible shots. It um, it solved a cubic equation to uh, get b bazooka shots, and then later I found I could just do a um, coordinate transform and call solve a quadratic, which was a lot better because the the cubic equation um, was a little bit inaccurate. You had to have a threshold for uh, what complex solutions to ignore because their imaginary part was really small. Oh yeah. Um, oh wait, why is it cubic? Because like uh, if you look at like tossing a grenade that's like a quadratic equation that's a quad yeah but i'm talking about bazookas yeah oh. the wind the wind and gravity okay um, yeah that's actually that that is actually hard to figure out um exactly how they did that did you have to do some like tests of the game to make sure that like what you well, were i i um found a part of memory that had the uh coordinate the coordinates of the current worm in it oh, okay. and uh it actually turned out that the way that i was using to, to examine memory did not have access to the heap so i was mm -hmm. getting information from the stack um so that resulted in some peculiarities but uh it, it did work but um then oh an even later version i was directly getting the information out of the heap because I was I put a, a breakpoint in the game code itself. But yeah, I mean I, I kept improving the thing as I, I went, making it more reliable. Um, but uh, so yeah, so I was still sharing it with friends at this point that I uh, added the auto aimer and many other features um, like uh, I mean there's some a lot of cool ones you could see all of them probably there's a, a list of them somewhere but uh yeah and the current version do, so like silkworm doesn't actually work on the current worms arm again this was like no no a, yeah. a um, long time ago but uh Here. yeah so I, it was starting to become clear to me that um well what this program that i had written allowed cheating and some of the friends i'd given to actually were using it to cheat. I didn't mean it to be used that way. I meant it to be used for fun um, when yeah, you know, yeah. everybody agreed on it and not, but, uh, oh yeah, and I, I mean, the bugs like putting a girder anywhere, intersecting with other worms, you could just drown them by uh, having mm -hmm. them fall through the landscape, those, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so it, at a certain point I, uh, 
<laughs> well, I wrote an anti-silkworm uh, that remotely disabled the earlier awesome. versions of itself. That's so cool. <laughs> so, like, and, you um, just had to like run anti-silkworm and just like type in uh, commands. How, like, how did it work? Yeah, yeah, there was a command you typed in the chat, <laughs> and um, that's so cool. And it wasn't perfect. I mean, if somebody was actually in progress using the auto aimer and you and you used it, then they'd be stuck there. They wouldn't be able to do anything because it oh, would man. keep the uh, the cursor active. But um, punishment, yeah. And some people <laughs> thought that the 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 way that I did that anti silk worm was because I had planned for it all along. I had um, you know, like a, you planned uh, to you planned to spread silkworm and then to. Uh, so yeah, as a way of like catching the cheaters, of course. So, it's I like mean, I, I guess you put a trigger in there from the beginning that that um, but that's not <laughs> no no no. It's, it's because like later I found an arbitrary code exploit and um, I used that same ar thing to uh, add customizability to to let um, so the version the anti silkworm also had. Um, an option to uh, open up um, adding the super weapon, all of the super weapons to schemes um, oh, and, and select I... worm as well. And mm -hmm. it accomplished that by sending um, arbitrary code to, to all players connected. And, and getting that to synchronize was pretty interesting, complicated, but. Uh, that sound that sounds really complicated. Like, <laughs> like having to do that with like all the players currently playing. Like, it needed people's IP addresses or something. Like, no, it um, it so that changed the the checksum. The game checksums itself mm -hmm. to make sure everyone has the the same state. So I had to fool that by uh, to making the new checksum equal to the old checksum. So I found a way to um, patch a small portion of of bytes to make the checksum equal before and after. Oh my god, this sounds um, like this sounds like genius level stuff uh, to my then, <laughs> to my then, friend. Yeah, one of the other things that I did was um, uh, the game did not work <clears throat> on the newer versions of Windows that were coming out at the time, Windows two thousand and XP, and uh, I fixed those bugs by patching the the game. Um, that was done by just done by the straight straight up patch. Yeah, so and, like uh, did some so like some people actually needed your program to even be able to play the game. Yeah. Like at and, the time. And, and me, um, it actually helped me a lot too to be able to run worms on uh, Windows two thousand. I didn't have XP at the time, just two thousand, but uh, my fixes worked for both. And that allowed me to do proper uh, network logs of the game. Because well, uh -huh. for the first year that I uh, of network logs that I recorded, they were in a horrible format. That mm -hmm. actually, that's the story in and of itself. But uh, see, I was planning. I w I did these network logs because I thought at some point maybe I will actually first engineer the game enough to uh, convert these to well to, to play them back to play them back. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I didn't have dream at that point that I'd get the source code. Be efficiently working on it, but um, I did think. I mean, no game that I played before that made me even think. Oh, I really want to record this. But Worms, I mean, it's such a rich game that I really yeah. wanted to record the games. I mean, everyone was so different. There was so much, um, so many interesting things that could happen. And yeah, like, to have like... a replay. I mean, recorded of the first discovery of a certain. Um, glitch or a certain trick. I mean, that's that would be so cool. I thought so. Yeah, uh, and like also like in the early two thousands, it was really hard to record like actual video of things. Yeah. So like, yeah, the idea yeah. of having a replay is like amazing. Like a really small file size thing you can just play back mm -hmm. is like that's incredible. Um, so um, yeah. So being able to. Play the game under Windows 2000. I was able to use Prom Microsoft Network Monitor, which records much better format. Um, but uh, the one I was using, which was just um, a, a WinSock logger that recorded in text, and it had um, 
ambiguous things about it too, which I, anyway, um, so I had this version which uh, um, enabled working on the newer versions of Windows and added customizability and allowed remotely disabling um, the old cheat versions. And um, Martin Brown from Team 10 Scene sent me an email asking if I'd like to work on the game officially. That's and, why it's and it was it how was a can dream you, come true. How could you even like oh that when you woke up that morning and read that I can't even imagine how happy you were. That must have been yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it was amazing. So basically you impressed this guy so much with your ability to like reverse engineer the game and this this program you're this anti silkworm <laughs> like that basically just caused him to reach out did you think it was like a fake email at first or no i i believed it okay uh, i was just about um, to ask did you run around did you actually pinch yourself to make sure you weren't still dreaming <laughs> but like i mean you know I, I probably looked at the headers to confirm it and stuff and it said you know i probably saw that's, team 17 in the headers that's so his I, signature i've seen <laughs> I, know, I know his signature Right, and Martin Brown is he's known as uh, Spadge, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the name I've seen him use. Like sometimes he would communicate on like the Team Seventeen forums, other places like that. He would talk to the community. Um, so, so I mean, it's a ama- It's props to Team Seventeen, like for actually paying attention to the community, like at that time and like reaching out to you. Like that's that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I have a, a ton of respect for Martin Brown. He. Um... So uh, the plan was um, that I would come to England and work on the game there for, uh, I think it was um, three months. That turned Mm -hmm. out to be the plan. And, um, but um, um, up until that point, I was communicating with um, a programmer there and telling him about the things I'd already found. He had, it's like like telling him how to uh, fix the Windows, newer version Windows bugs. Um, but, uh, so, <laughs> uh, well, there's a bit of a mix up um, and my going to England. And um, mm-hmm. I didn't actually have a work permit, so I wasn't allowed to stay. So I got to oh, be in, gotcha. and I got to see Team 17 headquarters. That's dope. And then meet meet the employees there. Um, oh, that's- Dead Code, I've got a question for you. So, you know Mental, Liam, um, he told me that when he visited the headquarters, the server for Worms Armageddon is literally just a really old PC or something in like some sort of spare room somewhere. Is that true? Did you see the same thing as well? Oh, I, I probably did, but uh, there was so much to see that I, I probably didn't focus on that one detail. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. Co- I mean, ones. one of the things they showed me was uh, um, early versions of Worms 3D and what they, oh, they were working on. At that point, it wasn't released cool. yet. <laughs> that's wild, because, yeah, like, I forget when the first Worms 3D came out, but, like, it was kind of a big deal. It's like, I remember being excited for it. Although yeah, I, I was really... excited about it at that point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't really play it much, but yeah, mm. <laughs> we were excited at the time. Uh, so that's cool. So like you were, you went there, uh, you made contact with them, and then like from then on, you had to like go back to the U.S. But like so yeah. You... So since I had to go back, um, uh, Volcano Dave Watson burned the source code onto a couple CDs for me. Oh my god! And. Uh, that may actually have been a blessing in disguise that I didn't end up working on it there because maybe if I had, it would have only been three months. But since I took the source code home and worked on it at home, I, uh, after the first beta version, mm-hmm. I just, I kept working on it. Yeah. And, it's like, um, they can't, they can't stop you from working. On it. <laughs> and, um, and Martin Brown had not been planning on that, but he mm-hmm. released it one, one another version after that original beta was ready, he you know, was okay with releasing that and um, going ahead and just releasing more updates. And uh, 
And like, so, I mean, we had a lot of, com so on the work of the original beta, we had a lot of, com I had a lot of communication with um, Team 17 and we had, I was using a, a bug tracker um, mm -hmm. of well, the, the, the one that they were using. It was this uh, horrible uh, piece of um, commercial software that, uh, yeah, it was pretty bad, but um, they probably paid through the nose for it, but. Uh, was it was it Microsoft product or <laughs> no no <Okay. laughs> um, the stuff that uh, the, the the bug tracker that um, I'm using now along with a current team of alpha testers is really good um, I can but, tell uh, I mean yeah I can tell from the results we're getting uh, you know worms Army is extremely bug free which we love but, but yeah that's I mean Thank you, but um, <laughs> so I did have um, add my proposals, like my idea for replay files, that was included in the original run, I mean, in the original bug tracker and all that. And um, and I think Martin Brown said something like that, uh, that can wait or it's, you know, it's not, not important for this uh, beta. Um, so yeah, I mean, that didn't, make it into the first beta. And I, I didn't even work on it at that point. But then in the next two years, I did. And i um, really glad that I did. So I think that um, Worms Armageddon is one of a very, very few number of uh, games that it might might be the only game that, that has a replay file that with compatibility going back so far with so many uh, logic changes. That's because and, you and I've always yeah. <laughs> that, I've always I've been fascinated for a long time with the concept of emulation, and oh yeah, one of the first really big projects that I did. In fact, the first big project that I did in 100% assembly language was an Apple emulator, and uh, and then I added a sort of emulation mode to another thing that I worked on, um, Fargo um, operating system for graphing calculator. And, nice. <laughs> uh, so I already had worked on this concept before then, and but um, it really reached a, a pinnacle with the, the way implemented into Worms Armageddon. And, um, I didn't. At f yeah, I mean, um, well, one of the one of the problems with the, the source source code was um, um, you built it; it was not compatible with uh, the existing version three point oh. Um, okay. Because of the way it generated checksums, it uh, included some some memory addresses were included in what it checksummed, and um, I figured that out and I got it to be compatible with version three point zero. But that was something later. I mean, that was not on the original yeah. beta. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah. So a little a little hard to work with. That's. I mean, that, I'm glad you figured that out. But yeah. <laughs> but not, I think but, that was actually one of the reasons that they did not release an update is that it wouldn't have been compatible. I, I seem to remember would, some, some communications at the time that that, uh, that was mentioned. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, this was right. And this was a time when like updating games in general was a difficult thing. It's like we didn't have games on Steam yeah. in the early 2000s. So it's like for updates to work, it's like you had to have some way of like notifying people people had to actually go and like download these updates. Uh, and then sometimes people wouldn't, and it was really annoying. <laughs> like you would get into a game and be like, dude, update your game. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, so it sounds like this was, uh, it was a little hard to work with at first, but like, so you had this idea for replays almost from the beginning. And mm -hmm. like, I would say the replay system in Worms Armageddon, like, I don't know that much about replays in other games, but like, the file sizes are like so small, like each one is like yeah. kilobytes maybe. And um, we use these replays all the time. It's like, instead of having to record like footage, we can just like click on this tiny little file and they're small yeah. enough that we just by default, if people don't know, like in Worms Armageddon, like every single game you play, there's a replay of it. So like, if you didn't know that, you can go back and check in your like yeah. user slash games folder. But um, this is and something that's someone, like, yeah. It's, if it's, I had been, I, oh, sorry. I just want to say it's like 
I feel like every game should have this. It's like there are so there are so many I mean, questions to ask on replays alone. Like, how did you come up with the idea? And it's not just it's not just the fact that we can replay the game. We've got so much control in what we can do. We can skip forward. We can set markers. We can do so. It's not a lot. There are other games who have the feature of replays, but I don't think there's any that exist with the do you know whenever you got a feature in a game you sort of think why didn't the developers include this well with worms it's like the developer included everything we could possibly think of because he cares he's not interested in the money and i appreciate that but yeah i mean um if i had had a, a different mindset, I might have made the, the replay recording and opt in, but I, I'm really glad I made it uh, just automatic because uh, people who are just getting into the game, they probably wouldn't think to enable such a thing, but then later on, they might be really glad that their earliest games were recorded. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, because when I started Worms in like, I don't know, like 2000 or, or something, on mostly on Worms World Party, but like, I wish I had the replays from that time. Like, we didn't quite get the replay feature until... I forget, Oops. when was it, like, publicly released? Was it 2002 or 2004? I can't quite remember. Um, maybe it was 2000... Wait. <laughs> 2004? Three? When was uh, it Dead Code? Oh, it's hard. I, I missed something for just a moment because I accidentally unplugged my... Wh which year was phones? the replays? What? Three or four? Oh, four or oh, three? Oh, yeah, it was oh, four. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. February oh, four. I don't even have to look that up. Also, yeah, so sorry, uh, Korean Red Dragon is asking Dead Code, wh when will we be able to rewind to? Yeah, um, so pretty early on I had a, an idea for how to do that. I just haven't gotten around to it, but... Uh, I do think I will add um, a backwards play mode at some point. Yeah, typically it doesn't matter that much. Like, replays are generally short. Um, we typically can, like, restart them. But it's like the features that we have, we can watch them at basically any speed, you know, like yeah. a quarter speed, a half speed, triple, yeah, quadruple. I, I <laughs> on adding a lot of features, like being able to search for certain type events in the whole batch oh. of replays. Search search for cool moves. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, like, so that would even help with, like, testing things out. It's like, if you want to, like, search for some anomalous thing, like, like, one time we were testing, like, okay, how often does a cow turn around when it, yeah. like, bounces into a wall? And it's like, that's the thing. It's like, oh, it's 6.25% of the time. It will turn. <laughs> it will turn, uh, <laughs> and it's like at some point I wanted to confirm that that number was like accurate. I think that's one of the numbers. I think like I sort of gleaned that information from you through like you know the code. But <laughs> oh, um, yeah. uh, I mean, so, one of the sorry. things I have tested I'm, 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 empirically was some um, crate probabilities, and those turned out to actually be what they claim to be. But yeah. Oh, I, was, I was just nice. going to say if you guys are okay with it because usually we just do a one hour interview but I'm quite happy to go on until 10pm GMT or something like that because we've got a oh. lot of questions here to ask and we were also going to do okay, sure. some maybe Team 17 matches between you two guys later on as well so yeah yeah I got time we can... yeah I'm fine with that because you've got so much to say, and I'm pretty sure I speak for everybody when we're like, we don't want to rush you through the questions. We want you to take your time <laughs> and say whatever you want. So I'm quite happy to go on for as long as it takes tonight. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if I was taking too long on certain... No, 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 no. no. Yeah. <laughs> say exactly what you want, however you want. <laughs> yeah, but so for Team 17, so like you started working with them... And then since you like kept on working on stuff, like so to some extent, like were they were they asking you to continue patching things forever? Like no. how did how was that like whole relationship? No, I mean like, they did... thought that it would just be that that first beta release and that would be it. Just... Gotcha. But like you were so dedicated, you kept going and Oh yeah, and and also I did get paid a little bit, it was only for that first 
beta. Um, I haven't been paid at all since then. Um, I just do it for the love. Um, yeah. So I, I think that shows, like, I think a lot of times when people, like, do it for the love, it's like, that's how we get these, like, bug-free games. Whereas a lot of, like, modern titles are very much, uh, even, like, AAA games are, like, very much, like, extremely buggy on release. Because, like, there, <laughs> there's not, there aren't those people who are, like, dedicated to, like, stamping out bugs and, like, improving the game constantly it's like they're paid a certain amount to do that but it's like you know the end product yeah uh, <laughs> like just Bethesda, whatever comes out like Bethesda for example who relies on the community to fix everything <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that's that's true um yeah oh let's see i guess our next question was um well we were talking about replays uh, did you have any, like, inspiration from other games when coming up with the replay system? Hmm. Um, no, I, I don't think I'd ever played anything before that, uh... Yeah, I, I mean, if you, you... I guess, uh... Like, Doom had some kind of demo system. Doom. I never used it, though. Yeah, I think that... Maybe that's the only game I can think of that had a replay system. I I I don't really know. I just know from like seeing speedrun videos, there was like a, a speedrun community in Doom really early on, so they they had replays there. Um, I don't know what other games had replays. I think like it was kind of a revolutionary concept at the time, but looking even today, it it still feels kind of revolutionary. Most games just don't have this basic feature uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even remember any to be honest um not definitely not the way worms armageddon like I, I, maybe some had like a, an instant replay feature but i don't know i, I don't even know any games mm -hmm. that had full replays personally speaking and i thought it was strange that that worms armageddon had an instant replay feature and they didn't think to <laughs> make a, a full game recording because yeah, it's not that different. It already had a lot of the pieces in place. Um, you know, a lot had to be filled in, um, but uh, I mean, the, the basic framework was there. Oh yeah, because yeah, it's, so, sorry, it's like while we're talking about the replays, um, I don't know if you've explained it already while I was chatting to KRD in the chat, but can you explain the way that the replays work? Because it's not, it doesn't just show a video of the game, you know. Yeah, um, it doesn't record key presses either. It records um, game messages. So like, when you press keys, that results, that's translated into messages. Um, so like, um, you know how pressing space and enter in different contexts do different things, but those are not recorded the same way in all contexts. So like if um, firing a weapon has a certain message, and um, dismounting from the remote or jetpack and stuff, so those that's a different message. In fact, it's the same message as jump. Jump and dismount are the same message internally because there's no context in which you could do both. And okay. um, there are actually some things that you can do with messages that you can't do with a keyboard. And you know, I probably should at some point make those completely impossible. There's, I, I did. There were some uh, things like that that I did make impossible, like dropping an infinite number of cows. Um, <laughs> like because you, well, if you told the game to drop zero cows, it would actually drop one cow and keep your turn running. So that oh. I fixed because that was that okay. was way too terrible um, an exploit. But uh, there's some things that are not so terrible that it you actually can technically do using messages just not the keyboard or mouse input. Um, moving the cursor outside the map is one oh. of those things. There's gotcha, actually gotcha. no protection against that still. Um, Interesting. So it's like someone like, could like, potentially uh, do that on like a cave map and like teleport above the roof or something? Well, the, the, the most major thing you could, you, no, you can't teleport above the roof. I fixed that. But what you can do is more subtle. You can set a homing weapon um, <laughs> to a coordinate outside the map, and that could let you hit something you couldn't hit otherwise. Especially yeah, for those that's... types of homing shots where it spins around for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
I guess, yeah, that's true. Oh, Dead Code. Have yeah. you seen? Have, have you seen Dario's tutorial on how to do those? Well, I think he calls them home and roulette or something, where you 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 can aim at a certain position way over here, and it'll spin round and round, and then fire back. And he's really accurate with it. It's incredible. I have not seen that. I'm surprised that there's a way it's... to to get a, some degree of accuracy with those types of shots. Oh yeah, it's I'll, scary. I've always assumed that it's, um, they're just as unpredictable. You I'll, I'll send the link of that to you later. Yeah, he okay. memorized a whole system. It was only him and one other person who memorized this homing roulette system. Wow. I, I forget who the other person was. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, I tried to learn it and I was like, God, this... I'm never going to use this, <laughs> and this this is just oh. going to occupy my brain space. Yeah, like, yeah, that's something that maybe I'll talk about at some point at the interview. That that kind of idea, because um, I kind of think that way about notching. I, I don't. Oh, yeah, I yeah. want to try to learn it. Yeah, <laughs> notching. It's it's a system. Well, I don't use it very much. I did in see, speed in like BNG. See now. We've we had this conversation with KRD and a few others when we were streaming the BNG Akimbo recently. So we've actually evolved how we explain this. So there's three terms now. A notch, right, which is the smallest increment you can move the cursor. Notching is where you're just doing it bit by bit. And then counting, which is when you're actually using like what barman and stuff did where you know exactly where to aim because of the distance between worms and you know that's a 10 so you go one two three four five six and then full power and you can literally hit 100 percent of shots if you know how to count properly well, does that mean that i do do notching because i do sometimes and everybody um, does <laughs> everybody change, does change the uh, uh, angle by a small amount yes um, knowing i mean what kind of effect that will have on it i just don't it's a it's a relative thing rather than an absolute it's, it's sort of it's yeah. like it, it's like so i i play on the resolution that you hate dead code but it's the one that i learned <laughs> how to be in g on 1152 uh, by 864 because i f basically from one side of the screen to the other a uh, two bar or two arrow wind straight up full power goes exactly that screen distance. Now, that's not something that I need to count out. That's just something that because I use scroll lock, because I use such a small resolution, everything I do, I aim to that screen distance. And then it's like, I know without even counting to move it a little bit there, a little bit there. Mm. And sometimes you're like, I know how much it is, so I need to do individual notches and notching to move it just that little bit. So it's impossible for anybody not to be a notcher or do notches, especially if you're right. doing like mission speed runs and stuff as well. But it's okay as long yeah. as you're not, as long <laughs> as you don't use a ruler on your screen and you've got Let's this see, chart yeah. which you, you literally do everything by math because that that's just boring, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, don't like yeah, using things like transparencies or well, shit on your screen is like it's totally off limits. Um but actually on I that I feel note, that if I did counting it would be a step backwards because I already reverse engineered the game enough to write an auto aimer. So uh True. I, <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. I feel like actually I don't remember I think I sort of like when I came to Worms Armageddon after Worms World Party, like I missed anybody using like any auto aimer stuff. I was like, "Wow, this is this place is clean," because I never encountered those people. I think I, I just came in like 2002 or so. Um, but actually, though, on that note, on um, on notching stuff. So if people don't know, like notching just means like okay, the game has discrete angles that you can aim at. But um, you've always talked about like I forget what the what the word is, but just having continuous angles. So oh, yeah. like so that is something that I'd I'd like to implement an option for at some point. Yeah. Is a and well it's sort of an auto notching feature. I mean anti notching feature that uh, would make notching impossible because it would just time the amount of how much you time you hold down the arrow key and move by that exact continuous amount rather than quantizing it to uh, 128 different angles. Yeah, I mean that would be that would definitely be interesting. That would achieve like, you know, you have to play by feel for the most part. P 
people could still to some extent like think about systems for aiming but it mm -hmm. wouldn't be like quite as uh you know abusable i guess it'd be really interesting to to see what effect that has on bng yeah Pro, Pro um BNG. Well, the most interesting thing I heard of is when I was, I think, I was speaking to you at some point, Dead Code, and you explained that the only way to truly counter people counting in BNG is to introduce that system. I don't know what you called it, but it means that you can't do notches. It's like how long you press it for. Did you, can yeah, you remember? Yeah. Could, could you explain that again, please? Well, I don't know exactly what parlance I may have used at the time, but in continuous time, continuous, uh, basically have a, a continuous time system rather than the uh, the frame-based time system. Yeah. Um, I think that I have uh, experimented with changing the frame rate, uh, and that never quite resulted in the same exact physics, especially with the rope. So um, at this point, what I'd rather do is um, have a hybrid system where it's frame-based for some things, continuous for others. Um, I, yeah. In fact, in fact, I think that the continuous input system would also work for rope, and it could make um, tool-assisted roping a totally different experiment experience. Right now, tool-assisted roping, most of it, if you if you're roping at maximum speed, and that's your aim, is to get from A to B in the smallest possible amount of time, then a lot of that experience is um, just brute forcing the input to find um, something that puts you, um, that lets you get between two points and still be able to shoot the next rope at the angle you need. Um, and to do that, you have to to actually uh, slow yourself down just a little bit, um, if right? You, because then otherwise, you just won't get the angles that you need. But you got to you got to like time, stagger yourself. Yeah, a continuous time system would actually allow you to literally rope at maximum speed the whole time, and get the tiny in between increments yes. angle that need even with that i would love that. Be super interesting yeah yeah so if people haven't seen dead code's tool assisted roping runs i think you can just google a uh, youtube search uh dead code tas roping probably i um, i actually dead code actually sent me the folder with them we could maybe play um yeah, I, I haven't those made... have the most up-to-date things yeah um, um the Mission Impossible one is one of the uh, one of the hardest. I mean, that would take thousands and thousands yeah. of runs. Yeah, Corey. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, Como. If you can put that on the screen, that'd be cool. Um, I know Corey Dex also had a video compilation of like your your roping runs. They're all super interesting, and um, yeah, I think the first time I want to say like the first one you did was like mid like two thousand five ish, maybe something like that. Or before, but like it blew everybody's minds at the time that roping could be done in this way. Like some of us had imagined it, but seeing it for the first time was like totally I incredible. Didn't know the, didn't know could the you, tool assisted at that point. Dead code, could you answer something? Oh, wow. That the, the folder that you sent me with all those um uh the TA things, do I need to use my TA bolt for them or will the normal no, version No, they're, they're compatible with uh, right. all builds. Right, I will look for those as you two continue the interview. Oh, sure. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, tool assisted. So, like, yeah, if we had uh, continuous roping, so, like, I guess, like, I sort of explained it in my, like, most recent roping tutorial video uh, for people who, like, don't know how roping works. But it's, like, it's sort of, like, the limited frame rate of the game makes it so that, like, if you're doing something like, uh, you know, a kick at really high speeds, you're Fair only going to get like certain angles that you can release yourself at. But what Dead Code's talking about is like we would have a continuous range of angles, so you could always get that perfect kick that goes like perfectly straight. You could always do a perfect climb that goes like yeah. perfectly straight up. Um, that would be amazing to see. Like the T, although I will say like the TAS runs as they are already pretty 
amazing. But yeah, if we're talking about like optimizing things, like that would so sort of take this, it to another level. You'd be able to focus on rather than um, in brute focusing where you want to slow down. Mm -hmm. You'd be able to focus on uh, what is the actual optimal route. Right, right. Yeah, that would be so interesting to see. It, it would be like more of a, almost more of a pathfinding thing. Like, just like literally, what what is the shortest path would almost get you there. And something um, that I still don't really understand is uh, what the best way to optimize um, big rope races where you have a lot of space. Those true are hard because um, you lose a lot of speed going up. And I don't really know at this point what <laughs> the, the best, the fastest way to go up is actually. That's actually a really good question. So yeah, like, um, yeah, I wish I, I wish I could say that I knew, but I don't know either. It's, it's like, it's, it's going to change depending on the length of the climb and your, your entry into it. Uh, I feel like AI could solve this for us, some, like, machine learning, but... <laughs> well, that would find a local max, a, a local... It wouldn't, um, yeah. It wouldn't, still wouldn't be guaranteed to be the best. True, true. Um, yeah. Like, even if you ran it forever, it's like, you know, it would be nice if we could, like... It would be great if we could figure it out, like, scientifically, mathematically, what is the best climb, something like that. It's not going to yeah, be that easy, I guess. With continuous time, though, it, no, there might it. be ways that you could solve equations to, to uh, I mean, you have to introduce some assumptions, but um, it might actually uh, make it possible to, to do equation solving to find some of the best ways to go up. That would be fun. I would be down to try that, although I haven't, I mean, I do teach math, but <laughs> it might be beyond me, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, that would be cool, uh, the, though. That would be uh, some let's pretty see. hairy differential equations. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. Well, yeah, because like I remember like trying to like solve something for like what's the fastest way to get from point A to point B, and I was like, okay, this is mm -hmm. way too difficult. <laughs> I have um, occasionally used some math in some of my TAs. Like, um... Oh, nice. <laughs> um. But let's see. So uh, I guess next question. Uh, so you've added so many features to Worms Armageddon over the years. Which ones are your personal favorites? Well, obviously replays. Um, replays. Hundred <laughs> percent. Um. This one is insane. I mean. Uh... Well, yeah, but color maps. I mean, it it actually you have to remember that um, we used to only be able to text use texturized maps, so uh, that's a big one, of course. That was huge. Um, that was pretty revolutionary. Like we were playing on these essentially black and white maps, um, which now, if you encounter those, they look like sort of dull and lifeless, probably to new players, like these old colorless maps, but we didn't have an option. I think that was um, that was like sort of the default, <laughs> which was weird because we could play missions. Like mission maps had color, but you know, like I think initially when Armageddon was released, we didn't quite know like oh why can't we play maps in color? And then it's like we got that update and it was like amazing. Mm -hmm. Those pumps but are ridiculous. In this particular TA, I changed my whole tactic partway through the TA because I realized, um, yeah, I mean, it would have been taken way too much time to, to use this different tactic for the entire thing. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, oh, this one is like, yeah, this is very thorny. Like, even just getting a, a single straight up climb is hard on this one. Yeah, there's so many good uh, tool-assisted runs that you've done. If you're playing um, them in order, then this is literally going to go from the worst to the best. <laughs> yes, I'm, ju I'm just playing them in order that they show up in the folder. I don't know if it's name yeah, that would be or chronological. date. Yeah, right. So, yeah, this is kind what's... of going to show the evolution of my TA roping in this sort of a way. Yeah, what's interesting is like, I think some people might think that it's like, oh, you just use tool-assisted roping and you're like, 
uh, you're godly at it, but it takes a lot of practice and like understanding to actually be good at doing it. Mm -hmm. It's not just like hit a button. And oh. Yeah, because when Dead Code gave me the TA build and we tried doing this, the amount of times I kept, what I, I kept pressing the the space bar and it ended the entire replay instead of going back. Oh man, it was frustrating. So it it takes it oh, takes. I fixed a, it. I've already fixed that actually. Oh right, yeah. <laughs> but oh wow, that's that's crazy. Um, yeah, that's so awesome. now when you press space at the end of a replay, it will freeze on the last frame and then allow you to uh, go back if you want. Oh, that is Jeez. such a lifesaver. That's so awesome. And that last map that uh, was shown was uh, Herm TR-13. That was a map that like a lot of us used to compete on. Like A lot of rope racers were like, oh, this is the map to have the best time on. It was like me and Pure, Ryan... Some other rope racers i don't know how it came about but like everyone was like this is the map to <laughs> to like compete on um oh um I, if you're asking me about favorite features i could actually say one of them which was the, the work was started by uh cyber shadow rather than me um which is uh using your weapon panel uh when it's not your turn that's, that's become huge. instrumental very important yeah, you used to not even be able to view your weapons when it wasn't your turn. All these basic things, and that's, I, I think that's like a basic feature of like a lot of new Worms games too. Like I was playing Worms WMD, it's, yeah, it's like a lot of this stuff is becoming more basic now. Although they don't have replays there, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, if anything, Worms Armageddon has more features than like other Worms games. <laughs> Which is one reason we love it so much. I think Worms has more features than any other game I've ever seen. For real. Let yeah, alone, I, let I, alone just that, just any. It's got more than any other Worms game combined, and any other video game in general that I've seen. How about Moonwalking? That was like one of the most. <laughs> <laughs> that also blew people's minds. Uh, one of one of the first patches, I think. Uh, had moonwalking where we, you know, you can just walk facing the opposite way. It's, it's, I don't know. It's just a fun feature, basically. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah. It actually lets you do some things that would were impossible otherwise. True, true. Uh, but for the most part, it's just something that looks cool. It's very, it's very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. But yeah, moving on. Um, let's see. What else could we ask? How about what is the craziest bug that you've had to patch? Or like, what is the oh. weirdest? I mean, one of the craziest ones was uh, a mad cow collision that crashes the game. Oh, <laughs> man. Just... I... <laughs> Do you remember like what I... causes it? Yeah, well, I, I made, I added a portion to my battle race test map where all you have to do is stand in a particular spot and release a cow and it'll crash the game. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it happens when, I believe it happens when you, uh, the next cow is going to be released at the same time that you take fatal damage. It has to be fatal oh. damage, I think, if I remember correctly. Gotcha, means, gotcha. Yeah. So no, okay, yeah, no releasing cows at death. That was programmed in. <laughs> <laughs> that okay. And, but it, the crazy thing is how long it took before anybody reported this happening. That is it's, weird. I think yeah. it's like maybe people just assumed like, oh, you know, it's this game is crashy. We're uh, <laughs> it's also it's, it's just. I mean, it was it it is something that was very rare, but. Probably some of the time people just they wrote it off. It's all just another crash. But um, yeah, there used to be, as far as I know, all of the desynchronization bugs are fixed now. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's it's a huge thing now. I mean, you you could just you're guaranteed to be able to play a game and not get any desynchronizations. And um, people just used to take it for granted that occasionally you'd get them and. Nothing it is it is really nice now. It's like 
in the very early days of Armageddon, it's like, well, everyone had much worse internet too. Uh, yeah, that so too. it's I, like, I never really knew uh, what the cause was for, for games ending back then. I mean, it happened a lot. Yeah, I mean, it was like someone, you know, someone else in your household picks up the phone and then, <laughs> and you're done. Uh, yeah, dial-up was was kind of wild at times. Um, but yeah, it's like the game has just gotten so much smoother. It's like we can just play online without any problems now. It's it's amazing. Uh, and let's see. Moving on. Um, how about next question? What's the most interesting discovery you've made about a weapon or game logic? <laughs> just over, just in general. Hmm. Oh, that's that. That keeps changing. I mean, uh, I, I will. I can say without coming up with a particular that it really amazes me how, even after playing the game for such a long time, we still discover new things. Uh, but. Um, I mean, one of them is one that's been known for a while, a long time now, but it was discovered pretty late in the game's life. Was that, uh, and um, if you, you, well, there's the the old glitch that that uh, was discovered kind of early on, where you you can backflip, knock a worm upwards, and then um, do a Dragon Ball to get a, yeah. a much harder punch but um mm -hmm. the one where you can uh backflip a worm and then use an animal like a sheep and that pushes the worm horizontally that kind of blew yeah. my mind that did that is one it's like you can use that too okay like very rarely but yeah that definitely blew my mind um i'm trying to think like what's what's the most interesting i think like there was the time when you uh it was I forget, so like, maybe I gave you the suggestion or something, but you found out that moles can go through, like, uh, <laughs> through the ceiling, basically. Is that the race course I made for a mole that you're <laughs> Yes, yes. That was, uh, that was one of the craziest discoveries. It's like, we were talking about, like, collisions or something. Animals will check for, like, ceilings, but they don't necessarily do that check if they like actually go through a small patch of land so like moles right. because they can climb steep slopes they can like go through like really tiny sections of land mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah oh uh, let's see we got more ta replays and there's probably a really good answer to that i just can't think of it at the moment yeah um, I and mean, there's i'm trying to do these tas but the window to show this is a little bit weird and I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I think what I'm going to have to do is put the game down like this. Uh, what, what, sorry, what question are we on just now while I am uh, sorting this um, out? Well, interesting tricks in the game that I was really impressed by, I guess. That sort of Discoveries, yeah. Just oh, discoveries. What, what's the most, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got you, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, is there are there any discoveries you can think of that you like you figured out by like looking at the code? I'm, yeah. So, well, I mean, a lot of them I fixed now, so I don't know whether right. I can count those. But I mean, yeah. there was a one that uh, I found. So, I mean, a bug was reported in which um, it had something to do with. Uh, um, shot doesn't in turn, and shotgun, shotgun things that have two shots in them, and you were able to use those without uh, diminishing the number of that item you had. Something like that. oh, using it along with um, select worm, yeah. But um, oh. I found that I could actually tweak that and um, release a whole squadron of uh, aqua sheep. Oh my god. I think I remember hearing about that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, like, and you, so like you release them all and you can like control them all at once as a swarm. Yeah, a swarm, yeah. <laughs> and it, that's it that's requires the... having more than one worm on your team and having them um, select. And I think it also required select at any time. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool. I would actually love that as a weapon. Like, 
aqua sheep swarm. You can just <laughs> they they're just moving in unison. Oh yeah, uh, it's a legit option. It, um, yeah, just not, rather than a glitch. Yeah, maybe <laughs> I add that back in. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Uh, that would be cool to have a maximal like a maximal bugged out version of the game where every bug is just there. Oh, oh yeah, I actually did add. <laughs> A scheme option already to uh, bring back the girder glitch, the oh, interesting that form of it. I mean, oh not one where you could just place one anywhere without any restrictions, but one where you have to actually knock a worm and then mm -hmm. click at the time when the worm is not occupying that space before it comes back. Yeah, so this is this is the bug where you place a girder and the worm can like phase through the land and just drain. Um, mm -hmm. But it has yeah. to be and, specific circumstances. Right. And um, so wait, actually, as far as I remember, is that bug still in the game, but it's just insanely hard to, like, pull it off? No, no. Um, oh, okay. Totally good. Yeah, so, I mean, in the current alpha, there is a scheme option to add it back. But in, in the latest version of the game, it's just not, you can't do it at all. It's Okay. Fixed. There was a, oh, a, a version of it found rather late, which... Uh, it was still possible from a, a one frame window because there was a one frame lag between uh, clicking and use. Well, yeah, it was basically a one frame lag. So gotcha. Yeah. Fixed in the latest version. Latest and okay. Oh, let's see. We can move on to the next question. Uh, Dave, did you want to ask? Yeah, sure. So. Um, what is it about Worms Armageddon that's kept you invested and working on updates for over 20 years now? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good... Oh, my volume probably just increased. You know, that was probably what was so quiet. quiet. You might want to adjust it down. No, 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 that's I'll good. That. That's good. Um, yeah. Um, well, the richness in the game... And the fact that so much that can happen during games is emergent. It's not something that developers of the game planned. And there's like, you, when you're playing a game, this is the first time anybody in the, the world has ever seen this particular s set of circumstances. And you have to think of a way to solve it. Um, that that idea really appeals to me. Like a lot of games, um, you are railroaded into what the game planned for. I mean, in some of them, it's something in between where you do kind of have to do what they planned, but there are tricks that the developers didn't think of. But um, that's part of it. And, and the fact that the game is just so rich, has so many um, options and... and, and um, types of weapons and that they interact in so many ways that there can still be discoveries um this late into the game's life if nobody the knew physics before. the physics mm. of the game are like fine grained kind of like real life it's kind of like the same thing that makes uh you know a sport like tennis fun to play like you can put all sorts of different spin on the ball and like yet the there's really weird things about the physics that are not yeah. at all like real life and yet they right. work really well in the game yeah it's like um, you're learning I mean, a different physics the this is the weird things about how the bungee works the uh when you mm -hmm. dismount off the bungee your um well your your radial velocity is added as if you were pointing straight down even if you're pointing the opposite way it's and we, we can't fix it at this point. Everyone's used to it, right? <laughs> I uh -huh. mean, not, even yeah. as an option, it probably wouldn't be a good, good, even a good idea to add as an option because then you'd have two different ways to learn Bungie, and that's not so great. And um, right, I mean, right. weird stuff like you, you release off the jet pack, you go straight down rather than um, <laughs> maintaining your flight. Just, uh, yeah. And it's... then, I mean, a lot of things are decided on by uh, uh, Manhattan distance rather than... Uh, Pythagorean, Pythagorean distance, you know. But, um, a lot of things about it are unrealistic, but they work. And they're fun. And like, uh, or like when. And, and, oh, uh, the, the most obvious thing the way bounces work, the way you bounce grenades. Yeah. That's, that's 
only horizontal or vertical. There's nothing in between. And it works. Right. I mean, that it's, it's fun. fun. It, it's, uh, you can yeah, understand it's, how that, how those mechanics work and, and plan shots that way. Yeah. That's what I, I think that's one of the things I love the most. Like, so like anytime a weapon bounces off land or a worm bounces off land, there's only, yeah, there's only horizontal and vertical surfaces. There's nothing else. There's no like, you know, 35 degree surfaces. It's all just vertical and horizontal. Which it's sort of like I don't know, like playing pong or something. You know, it's like you only have those surfaces, but that makes it so you can predict things and get good at predicting them. Whereas I've seen like later Worms yeah. titles, like Worms Reloaded, they have a different collision system, and it's like you toss a grenade. It's like playing bocce ball. Like mm -hmm. you know, you're tossing this thing onto a, a lumpy patch of lawn, and you can't predict anything. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's that's one of the things we really love about the game, I think. That's super held up. And like I'm trying to think, like, I don't know how many games have a similar like collision system like that. Uh I, I don't know. Well, I can't think of that many games that are like similar enough to worms. So <laughs> Yeah, like uh, the, 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 you, you, there's a lot of this in the chat and there's a lot of it uh, for any any pl any player who's uh who's been playing Worms Armageddon for a few years or more, everyone says that the physics aged like fine wine, unlike newer Worms games. It's like, I personally feel that they already achieved pretty much the best that they could, but then Dead Code came along and whoosh, took that to heights that are better than anything they could do as an entire company. Like, like I don't know if that's entirely true, but it feels like <clears throat> Dead Code and Cyber Shadow, what they can do is better than the whole team. Like, to, especially the current team. And it feels like they stripped away features just so they can keep selling games. And I mean, fair enough, mm. they need to make money. If they didn't make any money, they would probably kill the servers, you know? Maybe we'll see mm. another great Worms game from them in 20, 30 years. Hopefully I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I did find, yeah, I basically just started playing Worms WMD, which is basically their latest, I mean, it's from 2016, but it's, it, it does have most of Worms Armageddon's, like, engine, I would say. Like, it has, like, most of the same stuff. Like, it seems like bounces are the same, but you can't, I guess the issue is, like, I can't actually, like, look at the pixels and, like, be like, okay, I know for sure it's going to bounce this way. It's more just, like, a resolution thing, I guess, but, hmm. um... They're, I think they're at least aware that like the community really loves Worms Armageddon more than pretty much anything else. Um, so they've taken like yeah. some steps to preserve that. I would like if they leaned more into it. I want like I want their next Worms game to be like oriented towards esports. Make right. it an esports like. <laughs> I know Worms that game, I'm. Like. I know that I'm maybe one of the few that feel this way, but. Like, do you know how Dead Code, when you said you woke up that morning and when you saw that you had an email saying, would you like to work on the official game? The the, 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 the feeling of, like, in some way they're kind of like your idols, the people who work for the game you've played. It's like, for me, doing this interview is somewhat similar to that. Like, you made, oh, thank you. The, you, you made like, the greatest video game I have ever played a hundred more times better and because of you, it, it, this game will never, ever, 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 ever get bowling. I will be playing this until I am an old man with a walking stick. I will literally mm -hmm. become the old granny. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the reincarnation of the old granny. And it, it's just and like, yeah. I, I, I and you. with that being said, I enjoy the game so much. I would be willing to pay like full price for the game every year for the rest of my life because it's given me mm -hmm. that much fun i would pay like mm -hmm. 20 30 40 pound a month eh, sorry a year for this game because it's just the greatest thing i've ever played and it never gets old and the community we, we, ha we have our issues like any other game but we do have a tendency to come together and get shit done when it needs to be done and we do work very well together when needed and mm -hmm. 
it's just amazing. Uh, I'm, I will be eternally grateful for everything you and Cyber Shadow have done to make this game even better. And I feel lucky that I'm even alive in this era of humanity to enjoy this because I think, obviously I'm biased, but it's one of the greatest things humans have ever done. <laughs> yeah, it's um, such a pivotal moment that I saw that uh, little bundled CD-ROM of Worms Armageddon, how much would be different if I hadn't? It is wild. Uh, yeah, so there was creating the pyramids, there was like going to space, <laughs> but then there was inventing Worms Armageddon. Yeah, maintaining it. That just just be, <laughs> just between. I feel like, the same way. Just between the wheel and going to space, you've got like. <laughs> we're in. Yeah, we're like. Yeah, we're in just the right spot in history. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we all feel the same way about the game. It's like, yeah, I'll be playing it until it's, you know, it, if at some point oh, yeah. in the future it's unplayable, I guess I won't play it then. That's the only thing that could stop me. <laughs> Uh, but even then, I'd probably happen, use an old. Yeah. I'll I'll just use an old PC. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you you have to use an emulator. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, I think we should all like just kind of set aside an old computer that remains unupdated, just that has <laughs> worms on it, just in case. Like, sort of put that in our bunkers. But physical know? hardware is never going to last forever. I mean, it's great True. what what people are doing to preserve retro hardware, but that can't go on forever. I mean, yeah. you at least have to to uh, replace parts, but some parts are not replaceable. These are um, application specific ICs that. Uh, nobody's reverse engineered so yeah you need we need dedicated people there's yeah it's like there's um there's an arcade in in portland like ground control they have like there's really just like a couple people that are able to maintain these old arcade machines like in the city um so it's like yeah you need some specialized knowledge there um but yeah moving on to the next question uh is there anything you're excited for and can reveal about the next update of the game, version 3.9. <laughs> yeah, well, um... <laughs> that cheeky giggle there. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what can I reveal Maybe to the public? I actually <laughs> want to reveal something right now that uh, has not been revealed. Oh, come on, point. come on. Oh, go, go for it. Let me just go and yeah, get a towel so, to sit on first. <laughs> I work, worked out, um, we worked out a deal with Team 17 where uh, we can release updates directly to the community now. What? what? I didn't know that. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah, what so um, after the next release, I think we're going to go on to a much faster release cycle. Oh, um, releasing minor releases um, a lot more frequently. Um, yeah, dude, that's amazing. I, I if like, they if they have finally sorry if they have finally finally gave the go ahead for that, somebody needs to buy somebody needs to buy the Team Seventeen staff a round of beer or whatever for that. That is amazing. Oh, dude, I <laughs> that's that, that's. Oh. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like we've been waiting for that for a long time. Oh yeah. Like they've yes. they've given you a lot of like independence, but it's like we haven't been able to like you haven't been able to like release stuff automatically. That's like that's yeah, incredible I mean, it, news. The last two releases were delayed by uh, months. So yeah. See see a follow up question to that in the moment. If that if you get the go ahead for that, what is like what's the feature you're most excited to get out there for the community first? Yeah, oh, the one that I'm most excited about personally. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if it'll make it in, um, but uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is getting the uh, the vector the vector format sprites of the game to uh, be integrated into the game to display in the oh, front man. end and in game. I mean, you might. Um, well, you might manage to get that into the front end at least. Uh, oh my God! So like, but wait, but I that... yeah, so like back in twenty oh seven, I believe it was. Um, I got the original Anima one point seven um, sprites 
um, all of the ones for the game from um, Team, Sem Team 17, and um, it was, it's in a proprietary format, so I couldn't do anything with it. Um, right. And Animo, that actually so only happened. Like a, that's a defunct <laughs> program now, right? Yeah. Um, that actually only happened because I noticed a bug with one sprite where uh, the, the freeze um, points. Um, the slant of your worm is the wrong direction if you're, you're like uh, one so of like, the slants. Yeah. It, but so both like of the slants to... are the same. Yeah, and um, so I asked for... Uh, I mean, I noticed that Worms World Party had that fix, so I thought, oh, I asked, um, do you have the originals for that? And instead of just that one file, I got uh, the whole set of sprites, and not just the, vectorized, the, the rasterized version, but the original vector. And um, well, it was in a really weird format, and you know, I didn't know, I had no idea how any of the format worked. Like, it, for all I knew, it might not even store colors in RGB. Maybe they'd be um, Pantone indexes. I, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> um, but uh, well, I, I tried to reverse engineer, starting with the colors, and I, I, I found, I sort of got my foot in the door, and. Um, because there was a set of sprites that were identical other than the color, so I compared them against each other, and, well, it was really weird. I mean, it didn't look like RGB. But then mm -hmm. um, after, I mean, every now and then I'd go back and uh, try to hack at the problem, and eventually I did figure it out how the RGB, it, it is RGB, how the RGB colors were encoded. It was this really weird encoding system. Um, and then, well, one of our alpha testers had an idea that oh, I could uh, maybe this this Animo 2.0 demo would help me figure something out. And oh. I mean, the, well, the form file formats changed between 1.7 and 2.0, and they took out one of the major features that um, the sprites of Worms 2, Worms Armageddon use, which is um, Vector pins, or otherwise called bones, otherwise known as bones. Um, oh, the Raven's asking for me, but I can't go now. Um, I think I, I heard it there. For Discord. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, there's this Raven who comes to my balcony and I feed him. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I thought maybe there were still some architectural similarities between those two versions of Animo, and it would be worth a try. Uh, and I mean, so the, the next thing after RGB colors would be find out how coordinates are encoded, and that I didn't have any idea how to get started on that. But um, you, the, demo, our, the Animo demo, that actually allowed me to. Uh, do some hex editing and figure some things out, and I figured out what the coordinates, how this coordinate system worked, and then from there, I just kept um, bootstrapping up and, and um, building upon that. And it was um, well, I marathoned on that project, and, and uh, I think it was um, like five weeks straight that I uh, worked on that wow. every day. And uh, yeah, that's that's wild. I find it really funny. It's like they handed you uh, the vector sprites, but they you had to untangle this whole puzzle just to be able to use them. It's like, can't make it that easy for you. It's like, here you go. But they, I mean, the they had no at way. The, like at the time, there was still a short amount of time that um, Cambridge Animation Studios still existed. And we did mm -hmm. email them, Cyber Shadow and I emailed them. Uh -huh. And, um, you said they just told us, yeah, the, the file format is proprietary. We can't tell you about it. And they, they, they offered to convert uh, the sprites to uh, raster for us for a price. Like, hmm. no. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, they, we gave them an example to convert for us, but they, they said they couldn't do it because it was missing a certain file. Well, that file was a black background. But, but they, they didn't even bother to. Oh. Insert their own black background. To uh, <laughs> that's really funny. Um, uh, man, 
that's a lot of work like just to just to get these files in vector format but it's like now that you uh so yeah that so that was in 20 2016 that i did that and um there were some remaining steps that i did some time later um and it's still not well the format is completely figured out now but um what still remains well the animo vectorization format is really um very powerful. It has some things that today's vector formats cannot handle. Oh. Uh, um, mostly um, the way that it can do um, variable width strokes and oh. uh, gradients. All of the gradients in that format are, are strokes. And you can have gradients in two directions at the same time, two perpendicular directions. That's cool. So what I have not Actually, implemented... That's... That seems really useful. Like, yeah, anytime I'm like doing gradient stuff in like a program like I don't know, GIMP, like G I M P, like it's always absurdly difficult. Like, I feel like there were some. I do remember some earlier programs that made gradients like easier. I, like, mm -hmm. I never used Amiibo, but yeah. So, uh, that, yeah, yeah. So, um, I've implemented both conversion to SVG, but um, and uh, rasterization, but uh, the the gradients are not implemented yet in my code, and um, I mean, that's not going to be. It's not possible to do that in SVG output because it just does not have that power power in uh, its ability to gradients. It has two types of gradients: linear and um, radial, and uh, it, it can't do curved gradients that follow a stroke. Um, so that's I'm just going to have to do that in the rasterization routines, but I haven't implemented that yet. It's kind of, kind of complicated to to make that performance. Uh, but the current code does run fast enough that I think it would be able to work in real time in game. Uh, that's so like this is mind blowing because like if people don't know like having like vectorized sprites, so like was the plan the plan is to be able to like zoom in and zoom out too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's like one and, of the and, biggest um, advantages. Not only of, will like, it look X -X. good, I mean, it's going to look good, yeah. but this is also, this could change the way the game is played because um, you could zoom in to, to fine tune the positioning of your worm, maybe. And then, um, like, I, can, I could introduce keyword controls that let you move your worm really slowly. So you could actually, uh, and you could see what subpixel is on rather than just having to guess. Because currently, there's no way to know. <laughs> beyond the half pixel where your worm is standing, you could only control it to the half pixel, and beyond that, you'd... Like, there's more, there's ways that some of them you even use in your speed runs right. of uh, locking your subpixel to a certain value, but um, with zooming that shows you your current subpixel, that could open up some new possibilities. That would be super cool. Like, one thing that would help with is laying mines on worms' heads. You could be a little more accurate with that, I think. Um, but yeah, speedrun stuff, 100%. Like, we could get to, like, more precise locations and, like, yeah. figure yeah, shots like, out yeah, more exactly. Padding, padding mines on worms, that, that's what, that'd be one of the biggest uses of it. Dynamite mine. There's, yeah, that'd be um, so really much... cool effectively randomness and where those go because you can't see the subpixel of yourself or the worm that you are hatting. Yeah. Especially <laughs> the worm you're hatting. Like you, there's ways that you could lock your own subpixel to something, but you have no way of knowing what the enemy worm is. Um, Man, and that then it's beyond huge. then making custom, it'll open up huge possibilities for making custom sprites by modifying the existing ones, um, and it'll be in, it could be in the same uh, style as the original. Um, and changing, changing be, the colors of things, I mean, that would be easy. That would be amazing. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, customization. Do you have any, like, big ideas for, like, customizing worms, hats, DLC? Um, I think <laughs> that's really not... Nah. I don't want to focus on how this is going to be used. I want to focus on making it possible to do mm -hmm. whatever your, your imagination goes to and then see what the community does with it. That's that's perfect. I mean, yeah. Um that's and that's that's another one of the things that we all love about Worms are we getting like infinite customizability. Uh 
it would i mean yeah it would be amazing if we had just a format where we could like customize worms in like any possible way uh that can come to mind and um uh possibly i'm wondering if anyone in the chat wants to like if we introduced vectorized worms is there going to be like an option like keep the old style use vectors or is it like everything's just vectorized by um, default I mean the the uh, of course of course you'll have the option to make it function like it does now, but I think the, under the hood it might actually uh, use rasterized versions of the vector originals oh. in that mode even because um, that would I mean, be we can rasterize them to look pretty much exactly like originals there's some tiny tiny differences but it's basically exactly the same thing um and well i mean the advantage of that is that uh they wouldn't have to be using the palletized versions of the sprites i mean well well maybe people will want to be able to do that too um <laughs> i don't know we, we, i guess we'll see how it turns i mean that's some time in the future right. i don't I, th I think it's un it's very unlikely that uh, the in-game vector sprites is going to be in the next release, but maybe um, front-end vectorized, where you can you have a size resizable front-end. Maybe um, even course. that is a, is a is a good chance that it won't be in the next release. But uh, <laughs> I will try to do it soon. Um, now, one thing that I I definitely have planned to be in the next release. Is, uh, to official make official the uh, the feature of uh, um, custom textures. Ooh. So that's become very popular, but there are problems yeah. with that being a uh, third party module. Dead code. So be much. Yeah. I think you would be very interested in this, but can you watch the TA on the screen for a moment? Oh, okay. I'm I'm watching. So you have an idea to make it better? Yes. So at the end here. Notice you go up and then fling yourself over. Why don't you just hit your head on the roof to end the turn faster? Oh, uh, I'm probably measuring time by uh, how oh, long right. it takes to actually get there rather than end oh. of control. Ah, right, yeah. right. Okay, okay. Right. No worries then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that mm -hmm. is a definite thing for the next release. Um, I have that as a, a mandatory part of it is to... Um, Awesome. Like, yeah. Um, um, but also, we, we may have a uh, true color. Um, ooh, that's, I, find, I think that's very important to add, as, well, if not alongside custom textures, at least very closely following it. Because uh, the longer time passes in between people making custom textures and true color coming into the equation, um, the less likely it is that they can remaster those, release the uh, the unpalletized versions. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, I mean, that's really huge. Like, yeah, in um, especially like in Chaos League, we've been using a lot of these new like textures that people have made. It's really fun, and it sort of brings the game back to life because it's like, well, this is like we've been playing on these same old yeah. textures for like twenty years, and now we're seeing some new colors and some like crazy new designs. It's super fun. It's also I assume fun to make them. I haven't made one myself, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's like being able to like have that more integrated sounds mm -hmm. awesome. Oh yeah, and um, something I would like to add and um, has a pretty decent chance of being coming in next release maybe or at least soon after is uh, custom um, templates for generated maps. Okay. So, like, I mean, as a very simple example, you could change the uh, the height of the bottom of a dual cavern, have it not so close to the water, but you could like, ha ah. change how many Ooh. how many levels are to it, and um, generate maps to different resolutions. And um, I I have a question regarding the map editing. Um, will it ever be possible to specifically move 
objects around. So, like, for example, when I make a BNG map, um, you've got to reseed the entire map. And if you if, if, if you place an object that changes one... Sorry, if you, if you draw something that changes one object, it changes all the other objects. So it would be nice if you could grab an object and place it, like, plop it onto something else. Do you think that would ever be possible? Oh, yeah, that's... Well, that's planned, but um, it's not something I had in mind to put into the next release. But um, as long as it's I mean, planned, it that's good enough for me. The uh, planning for that, yeah. <laughs> um, Perfect BNG I'd... maps win. <laughs> yeah, that sounds awesome. The, yeah. yeah, like being able to like raise, like have uh, say the I mean, map, that would like <laughs> open up also the possibilities of um, yeah, like changing packaging custom challenges in a in a format that you could just like, open it and start playing it rather than you have to manually teleport your worms into specific locations and stuff. I mean just, just having also, control. Just having control over those things like bigger, smaller, rotate it and stuff that oh and um, placing oil drums that's something that you just can't do at all currently. Oh true. Well, I mean, true. Technically you could um, have this elaborate setup where you say okay um, run an earthquake and then put your worms into block these passages so that the oil drums won't fall into these positions will fall in the other one. Like, then run a series yeah. of earthquakes where you place your worms <laughs> blocking the passages at different points. And that could be done, but no, that yeah, e <laughs> that would be crazy. Yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, um, yeah. For challenges, it's like we've typically had to like place worms and stuff, and that's that's usually a hassle. Um, yeah, that's that's awesome. And so I, I did I, um, actually sort of um, prototype a way to do that really early on, but I I didn't think it was um, flexible enough, so I I didn't put it in. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, that would have been um, you would uh, place some magenta bitmaps of precise shapes into the uh, PNG map, and those would be uh, parsed as object placements, but maybe I should have put that in. But, I would um, say, I mean, like, you, there's so much stuff that you're constantly working on. Uh, you, I'm sure you have to, like, kind of put things in order of priority. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like that's not, like, as high priority as, like, other things that you're working on. But, um... But, like, for a long time, though, there's been, like, a mythical plan for, like, Worms 4.0, which I assume you've, well, I, I don't know if that's the final version of Worms, but, like, that's sort of what <laughs> everyone well, that's calls Well, that's kind it. of the reason why um, I, I have to stick with 3.x until there's a yeah. certain level of customizability. I mean, right. I so guess like, I can um... call it. I can call it 4.0 when there's a fiddlerish, fiddleresque level of customizability. Yeah, that's okay. kind of the. Could, could the, you? The, uh, sorry, could you explain that I set? Could, could you explain what you mean by like fiddlerish sort of thing? Because some yeah, people might not know the, what the fiddler the is. The ability to make custom weapons using all of the customization parameters available, and maybe even some new ones, but. It, at very least, the available parameters that are in the, the game's engine. Um, so that would like, be I mean, so that would be amazing for um, for a cluster bomb. That's actually not hard coded. There's just a cluster type weapon is one of the things, and then you set um, well what what the sprite looks like before it explodes, and then what the the clustlets are <laughs> and what um, damage they do and um, what their spread is. And, Right, the spread, the center of explosion, how many clusters there are. Like, some of that stuff, like Worms 2, allowed you to customize. It, um, I mean, still, it was still only a tiny subset compared to what the parameters are. But, I mean, Worms 2 did let you change more parameters, but those are parameters controlling the, uh, the hard-coded creation of the weapons. So, yeah. So you would, you would ideally... For Worms 4.0, like you want to go beyond that and just have like have it be um, totally sandbox. What I'd actually like just... what I'd like to do is have uh, 
three tiers of customizability. So you would keep the ability to change stars, but then a tier above that, you'd have the Worms 2 level. And then mm -hmm. the top tier would be uh, direct control of the weapon's internal parameters. That would be, like, so incredibly robust that, like... I mean, and I feel like some... they would... There's... I would hope that Team 17 would, like, re-release the game. Because, like, that is, like, mm. a whole new game, basically. Well, I'd rather keep it as a... Uh... Yeah, I mean... I feel like... I, I don't want to fragment the community. Um, right, it's... right. Yeah. Right. It's also People important that you the, retain the control. New <laughs> um... And uh, yeah, there's something that I don't know if um, the original Fiddler did or not. I'm, I'm guessing it almost certainly did not. Is uh, there are a whole bunch of things hard coded into game about uh, um, the weapon indexes. I mean, where exactly a weapon is on the uh, the weapon panel. Um, I think mean, it just refers to certain hard hard-coded weapon indexes, mm -hmm. which means that if you edited those weapons so that they're like something completely different, they'd still apply to certain parts of the game in ways that are that no longer make sense. And that's going to be a, a big project going over and, and making all of those uh, flexible. That's gotcha. probably the, the hardest part of, the, of it is going to be doing that. And okay, I, I don't so want like... half measures. I don't want to add the uh, direct editing of, of weapon parameters, but keep the uh, the sloppy referrals to, to hard code weapon indexes, because that would just... Uh, yeah, that sounds like it would be kind of weird. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, so like your but, idea but is that would, like... For example, after this is done properly, you would be able to have more than one rope, and the ropes could behave differently. Like, you could have one rope that only gives you one or two shots, and you have another rope that's infinite, but they maybe the infinite shot rope would only be really short, and then the, the one shot rope would be longer, things like that. Maybe would maybe be, even yeah. have one of the ropes, um, it would use up its ammo in terms of how much you shot out and discarded, and, and um, then the other rope would be used up by how many um, times you shoot it, you know, different kinds of... That's like, yeah, that's like next level customization. That's that's really wild. I mean, that could lead to like, I don't know, that could lead to entirely new schemes being played. It could lead to, mm -hmm. you know, new challenges like custom mis missions people create. Like, I mean, there's, yeah, like the, the possibilities are crazy. Would that also mean like um, if you could create your own custom like weapon panel, like where like where the the weapons are located on that? Yeah, that's that's implied in the. You would um, be editing uh, when you edit a weapon and pick your index. That's that determines where in the panel it is. Cool. Yeah, that's that is important. I don't think, but as far as I, I know, we'll also, I don't think any Worms games implemented that. I think we will also have to make it so that the the width of the panel can expand. So you might want to have oh. more than five at a particular F key. That would that would be really cool. Um. Or like you could just make it any size. You could make it. You could like customize the way it looks. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, just like the the visual appearance of it or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it certainly will be able to zoom in on it. See uh, more detail on the. That sounds. Uh, this all sounds very amazing. Um. And uh, well, we kind of yeah. Uh, well, I guess we we've, we've kind of already been talking about it, but like um. Were there any like other big features planned for uh, the end goal of Worms 4.0? Like, um, is anything the customizability terms... was the main thing that um, yeah. 4. Point, back back when I referred to it as 4.0 and did those, did those forum posts calling it 4.0, it was mainly about the customizability, making it uh, Fiddler level, Fiddler and beyond. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Was there something with potential um, like online play matchmaking? Was that a planned idea? Not at that point, but I mean that's that that's point. that's something important, but um, that's not tied to. I mean, in that 
that could that could happen in nine, three point x maybe. Um, certainly important because um, without matchmaking, uh, you can you can game the, um, some league systems by deciding who you play with, and that's not so great. That's true. Um, yeah, for leagues to work right now, it's like also people have to arrange games, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of rigmarole to that. But um, yeah, like if a matchmaking system was implemented properly. Like, that would be a lot more ideal for new players, too, because, like, when it, whenever anybody picks up a new game, to play people, usually they're used to just clicking a button, not going to, like, a lobby, not having to go mm. to a Discord and find people to play. <coughs> Noobs! Um, yeah, yeah, but it's... <laughs> that would be super interesting to, to see, and I would... I feel like that could... That alone could, like, bring a lot of people into the game. Yeah, that's definitely an important feature. Oh, uh, let's see. So hold hold, hold on, because uh, KRD was asking something. Um, you've you've had this asked quite a lot, but speaking of priority, making it possible to continue disconnected matches, how hard is that going to be? Oh, yeah. Um, so there's kind of two ways that. Uh, two ways that can go and I mean we might end up adding both I, I think there's a good chance that we'll add both because um, one of those ways could just be abused and it would be really really hard to put uh, mechanisms in place to prevent it that the way of continuing a replay continuing from a replay file well think about how that, that could be abused you could um, study that game state and play from it privately and know all sorts of things about it, the the other person you continue it with um, never had that chance. Mm -hmm. That would give you a huge advantage. Yeah. Um, and I mean, for a long time, I was thinking, well, we'll just have to uh, to make it that good. We'll have to add these um, server verification and timestamps and stuff that uh, prevent you from being able to continue it. Could you not um, have at least in a, in a competitive way more than once? Is there not but, a way? Would there not be a way to do it? Um, you're probably going to say this, but all members who were in the game have to be present and have to do some sort of confirmation to acknowledge that they're there and ready to play. And if well, it doesn't have that, you can't actually use the file. I mean, that would have to be. Um, You'd have to have a server involved in that. It couldn't be done peer to peer. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Um, and I mean, I guess we, we could add something like that. Um, but I also want games to be continuable um, that were played before this feature was added. And the only way to do that would be to have no checking at all. So I mean, I think we need to have both ways. One, which is server verified. And the other is uh, just um, honor system. Sorry to interrupt for a moment, but this TA here, this is a very, very famous yeah, map. This, okay, this an, yeah. Yeah. So let's focus on this one right now. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll shut up and let Dead Code talk about this. Um. So it's, the really tight passageways in this mean that you need total precision, and um, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this took like 5,000 re-records, like, more than any other TA rope I've done. And I, I went through many iterations. And okay, that part that just did, going straight up through that passageway, which is exactly the same width as a worm, uh, took the bulk of the re-records. That is... So I'm playing it in slow and, motion right now, three times less speed, yeah. just so you can see what's going on. Like but Maybe... I don't suppose you can zoom in on it, but um. Uh, no. I mean, if I oh, if I if I put work, well, hold on, I can, but let me let me start my worms game and actually change the resolution. So then the first work. version that I did of this um, that I thought was finalized, and then Lex improved uh, upon it. He found a, a quicker route. Which also meant that he did 
all of that he had to heavy the same. brute forcing on the, the part where your worm goes straight up through the nine pixel wide shaft, which is insane. Oh, I, I, that, that's, that he did yeah. that. I mean, I, 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 I already knew how hard that was because I did it. And then I noticed that he did that <gasps> too. Me. I was very impressed. It's like um, you, you have to like redo a large part of the map, right? To get back to that point. Exactly. And like, that's the thing. You have yeah. to, keep going further and further back to change things because you might have already gone through all the possibilities back just a little bit. And so yeah, you need yeah. to go further back to change. And, and you're not changing things that are, that are different in a meaningful way. You're just changing oh, but those the two, just a little bit to open those, up different angles. Those back-to-back -back two swooshes at the top, that's just like... Uh. But in the continuous time version of roping... Uh, that would yeah. be easy. You could just get that thing up the shaft easily, and you wouldn't have to, to pump many times. You notice I pumped many times because um, mm -hmm. I know there probably is a way to get that with only a single pump, but it's hidden behind so many millions of, of re-records that it would be impossible to find, Yeah. even by yeah. automatic re brute forcing. And it's, it's Yeah, nuts. that is one of those things. It, it's also nuts that the... What was it? A twenty-one point something, or but the, I think that the current world record for actual humans playing this is like something nuts, like ninety or even more than a hundred seconds, which just goes to show how difficult it actually is. And this also has a historical significance. This was the yes. first map that I ever TA'd, and oh, right. at the time I did that, well, it was sixty-six seconds, I think, and I, I, I estimated this could probably be done in a third of that time. And then it turned out that it was almost exactly that. Oh, wow. Well. That's <laughs> wild. Um, uh, at that point, there wasn't even single step. It was just slow motion. Oh, yeah. Um, like with, there were fewer, the, yeah. yeah. You had fewer tools to work with, too. And there was um. no trajectory um, preview. You couldn't see where the next rope would, would hit. OK, um, that made it extra hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's that's wild. Yeah, when that came out, that was um, that was one of the first TA replays that like blew our minds because we had like a regular person challenge on that. I think maybe I won that challenge. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but um, also the the one so that improvement that Lex made on it. It was many years before I went and and redid it myself to uh, to beat his run. Yeah, can it still be taken higher? You think, or you you? Uh, you squeeze probably every... not by more than a second, practically yeah. speaking. I mean, I, as I said, you could probably get that shaft thing with one pump, but that would just be too hard. To find. But you should yeah, make uh, some continuous time. Then it could definitely maybe be improved by two seconds, maybe even three. You should make some sort of artificial intelligence that can learn how to do it at the, the absolute pinnacle peak, without like making Skynet, yeah, of course. Another... <laughs> That's another thing that would be a huge feature in Worms Armageddon is to implement a good AI. And, oh man, um, I would love I that. I think I, I don't, I have no experience in that at this point. Um, so actually, getting some help with that might actually. Uh, so yeah, that was all Dead Code's um, mission things there, basically. Um, so, did you ask the last programmer stuff question? Uh, you could ask the last one. <laughs> right. So, dead code. Um, I think so. What we'll do is after this question. So, what we're going to do is we're indefinitely going to have dead code and Mad Black play some Team Seventeen games because it's a great scheme to watch. Those guys are both excellent. However. We also have the challenge, the goat. So, if you would like to see Dead Code and Mablack play any other schemes together, let us know, and uh, we can get those as well. Um, so, Dead Code, Worms Armageddon is a wonderfully bug-free game. In contrast to a lot of high-budget modern titles, is this the result of having a solid team of testers? Oh yeah, I think that's that's really important. Um. I'm not just a solid team of testers, but um, having Cyber Shadow on the team um, resulted in a lot, a lot of changes to the way we, we do things. I mean, he's, he's written so many tools that, uh, 
and and I mean chosen other existing tools to have us use that um, have have allowed have made it easier to uh, to um, be organized at the the level that allows um, pinning down different bugs and um, features and all that. I mean. It was by his initiation that we moved to a, a version control system. Even I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't even using a version control system before he joined the team. Um, so that was that was really important. So like having, yeah, having a certain workflow for like reporting yeah. bugs, things like that. Uh, I assume that's a pretty important part of like making it, making the game what it is. Yes. But um I mean like from the people I like people I know who've tested like helped test the game like most people are pretty dedicated and it it seems like um cuz like I'm just trying to think like okay why why are these expensive like AAA budget games so incredibly buggy but then this this old game that has like a small number of people like testing and helping out with it it's like so well maintained. Uh, is it just a matter of like caring more? Um, yeah. Well, I I think that I mean, that's a big part of it. I mean, mm -hmm. I I find it really important to uh, to fix all of the bugs as, as much as we can. Um, it's. Um, It's a you know, matter of priorities, I think. Um, I mean, putting bug fixing at a higher priority does, to some extent, mean sacrificing adding new features. I mean, at least a sl it's a, it slows down the adding of new features. Mm -hmm. um, if you add features too fast, you're you're just you're going to introduce lots of new bugs, and okay, you'll never yeah, reach that a point where. Uh, yeah, it's like get the level of bugs <laughs> down. KRD, KRD pointed that out as well. It's it's also useful having a developer who actually plays the game at a high level. You know, like most yeah. games, the developers are like average at best at the video game they work on. Yeah, yeah, like the community involvement aspect. But yeah, what you're saying though, like quality, like it's sort of like quality over quantity. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> we want. We want the features that are introduced to be like, you know, nice yeah. and bug free, and not I'm, we don't need like an I'm infinite in this, amount. I'm in this for the long haul. I I, uh, <laughs> I have a long vision that could take a, a really long time to to uh, actualize, but um, I'm going to take my time on it so that it comes out properly. Yeah. And, it's like um, it's like a life so passing also, project. I mean, the replay system is. Uh, Having that makes it a lot easier to track down bugs and find their causes. If you just recorded video of a game that can't um, just explain what the cause for the bug that you see is, um, oh yeah, the re yeah the replays help incredibly with that. Because um, um, with a replay file, I could just um, step line by line through the source code as the replay is playing and find exactly what the cause for the bug is. Right. Oh, oh, and so, uh, okay, so we're going to move on to the the player stuff now. Um, so I, I guess this is more of a kind of casual conversation now. You probably won't need to think quite as hard. So what we'll do is we'll we'll host a game up. Um, we'll we'll start off with a team seventeen. Um, I would let either Dead Code or Map Black host. Probably Dead Code because he's much better at making maps for Team Seventeen. If you want to do an island Team Seventeen or something, and we can get that sure. on. Okay, um, I'm just going to be right back real quick. No problem. Okay. So yeah, if you guys have any other questions you'd like to ask Dead Code, um, yeah, feel free to ask. And we are going to we're going to play a Team Seventeen first. And then we'll put up a poll 
and see what the other scheme these guys will play and then probably after that second match we'll probably wrap things up there so yeah uh, if you'd like to see my black versus dead code and something else we have time trial rope race and battle race so far so if you have any other suggestions um, we will do a poll once we start the team 17 match and whichever wins will be the one that they play afterwards I might only have time for one game. I I do have to take the dog out. Um, oh, yeah. but... <laughs> okay, then. That's no problem. Yeah. But, I mean, we'll see what people pick, though. Yeah, a battle race will be really long. Uh, a TTRR would right. be much faster. <laughs> yeah. Right. Question. Thoughts on Tassin for front end so far for completely Tassin WA all missions? Yeah, I'll ask that when he gets back. Hmm. Yeah, dee -dee -dee. Yeah, those um, seeing the task stuff play well, um, having the conversation is quite fun. It's, it's some of the, yeah, some of the like, some of the things in the the Tula sister are just ridiculous. Uh, you could yeah, that. really insane. Um, yeah, and like the missions. Oh, I guess I forgot to mention two of those missions were actually Lex, not Dead Code. Uh, mission two and twenty seven. Uh, but um, yeah, a lot of those ideas are new, like relatively new. Like for the missions, like we only came up with those like within the last few years, and they had, um, I think they hadn't changed much in a while. But like, it was um, it was sort of me, like I was brainstorming a bunch of ideas and like asking Deadco to like just try this, try that, and uh, a lot of new strategies were formed for the mission. So like I think the total like tool assisted mission time, it went from like I want to say like maybe above 40 minutes it's definitely below 40 minutes now it's like 30 38 or 37 um i think it's, it's something like that if you take and if you do like if you add fade skip in where you skip the ending uh i think that brings it down to like the 38 minute range or something like that that would be great imagine having like a a co-op missions thing you could do speedrunning for and oh co-op speedrun oh. would be great that would be fun yeah or like um or like even making it like head to head yeah like that's something we've that's something we've actually wanted for um for deathmatch because like deathmatch is really it's like one of the most interesting speedrun categories oh and, you um, can't you can't yeah we've we've do you know what would be fun? We've, the ability to be able to host the missions. Because then you could do a real-time... You could do, like, real-time head-to-head missions. Yeah, like... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Just, like, that would be super cool. Oh, yeah. Um, We can... I guess, like, with missions, we can sort of do that. Like, if we really wanted to, we could just have, like, one person on this screen, one person on that screen, both start at the same time. Um, yeah, we'd love that, to see that's... that for like deathmatch and both players having the same deathmatch seed so it's like the same maps yeah because that's which... what we've done with oh, yeah. uh, now that I have the two computers set up we can actually do a real time race unfortunately you <laughs> can only do it on standard maps because of the overlay you need to have them in the same position you overlay them together and you make one of them transparent and then you can see both playing at the same time and it worked out really good anyway oh, welcome yeah. dead code back if you'd uh -huh. like to host up and we will okay. do that. So meanwhile, we'll get the next question added. So who are the first Wormers you met online and remember playing with? Um, oh, just a moment. I'm setting up a couple of things. Just no problem. <clears throat> Let's just check the chat just in case I've missed anything. Sykes been asking about daily challenges. I mean, that would be cool. <laughs> Movable terrain. Okay. All right. So um, some of the, th well, I, I don't know if anybody will know these names, but um, I, I rem thing I remember most is um, who I played Team 17s with. 
And the most, some of those were, um, well, oh, yeah. in no particular order, um, Strategist, um, Dirty Rat, The Living Dead, Blizzard. I remember um, Dirty Rat. I remember Blizzard. Um, was Blizzard the German player? Or a different Blizzard? It's a, probably a different Blizzard. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was a German player who was extremely good at Elite named Blizzard, but... I think I remember an earlier Blizzard as well. Um, Dirty Rat, I might remember. I remember this was. And then, sort of, my back. nemesis was um, MPH. Um, he, <laughs> he won every Team 17 with me except oh. for one. I, I, I only was, beat him once. <laughs> he was one of the early good strategy players, M, uh, MPH and Dope. I think they were both from the UK, if I remember. Mm hmm. And um, yeah, they they won a lot of like the CL2K like leagues and stuff. They weren't even like very amazing at like roping or anything, but they were like really good at like all the strategy schemes, and like they just kept winning. <laughs> uh, it would be interesting to see like old players like that come back and like see how much the game has changed. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna be right back one more time. Oh, no problem. MPH was everyone's nemesis. What, what 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 do you mean random OO? What was the what was that what's that in context for? I guess he's asking like did De did yet dead code play with him? I I don't ah. know. <laughs> yeah, those early players, um I guess play, like at the time people were playing like Team Seventeen, Elite, TNG. <sighs> Rope Race got introduced a little introduced a little later. People were playing like Roper, and for a while Pro was a scheme, which yeah is weird. <laughs> like yes. nobody plays Pro. Yes, Charles. Random talk. Random was. In fact, I can actually show you that right now. So, just give me a little second to load this up. Uh, so go to that uh, and then click delete that part uh, and then do that so um how am i actually going to i'm just going to have to come off the i'm going to put on display screen for a moment just so you can uh look at this um let me just log out first and then go back a page that you don't see that. Yeah, here we go. Because I don't want to show the thing. So here we go here. Um, as you can see, this is the the Era 1 classic overall standings and Random O was quite far ahead. He did have the fortune. This is one of the problems of TUS all round. Once you are so far ahead, before it became even more popular, it is easier to stay that far ahead, and it's really, really difficult for for well, not now because this 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 one doesn't apply anymore. But it was really difficult for anybody else to catch up because so many of the top players are gone. So yeah, I'm a little bit biased. Um, I'm a little bit biased when it comes to um, what am I trying to say here? Random OO um, doing his thing. Uh, so, yeah. should I stay on the voice stream? Like, I mean, you won't be able to do any commentating, but you could still use the uh, spectator build, right? Uh, I suppose I could, yes. Um, yeah, you just won't well, be able to talk about what you're yes. seeing. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be asking questions anyway, but I can open the weapon panel um, and do that. What I might actually do is switch to that. No, that view's not good for that. We'll just need to keep the window small up there. So you are going to see the game in a small window. Um 
I might actually change the resolution so at least you can see more of the game. So I will do that. Um, I'll change yeah. the resolution. I'll probably use the, what is it, 12... 1280 by 800 is that the one to one ratio one uh, mm, i mean no so you, you've if, got if like six 1280 would be 720 right hold on so 1280 by by seven ah there we go right right uh i will need to turn off worm kit modules and alter the game file thing as well uh, so just give me a little minute and I'll do that um, so worms are again maybe I should have actually had KID host he's so good at choosing maps yeah just get him to host then uh, while I'm doing this we've got time yeah you want to do that Gregor Gregor you can join the voice chat with us if you want oh no he can't actually he can't never mind because we're not oh, in we're not in the worm the CWA booth because we're doing like the the webcam thing. Uh, let me turn off. Uh, where is it? Where's the TUS stuff? So that no, not that. It's always good to have a, a third party choose maps. I've actually gotten so used to that. Uh, like with all of our chaos games, every single one is like hosted by somebody else and it's kind of nice for map making it's like it's sort of like that way <laughs> he's hosting a game 100 percent fair map picking here <laughs> and we'll just do dead code Please. finally fair a fair source of maps right What's interesting is, like, we've never really had a problem with, like, people picking, like, super unfair maps. It's so rare that that's ever an issue. I think there's been, like, like, in the intermediate community, there was maybe, like, one time where, like, Dario was starting to get annoyed at, like, too many complex maps. But <sighs> I feel like that got resolved. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's never really been that much of an issue. Although there are trends in uh, there are trends in map making that have not been good at times. Like for Elite, the maps got more and more complex. Eventually, everyone started playing on these ant hill maps, <laughs> which was uh, I mean it's it it's just I don't know. It made it so that you either had to be in G, or my preferred strategy was kill a worm, dig underground to the opponent. So that you don't have to ever be in the <laughs> like, uh, which actually mm. works. Like it, I was like, this strategy actually works, but not. Is it fun people. though? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's it kind of ruins things. Yeah, I know. I know this box looks really, really tiny right now, but when the game begins, it will fill up that box. Yeah. Right. So next question. Um. Did you play in many leagues in the early days, Dead Code? None. I, I never played competitively until really recently. And I joined some clans here and there, but I wasn't too active in them. It just didn't really fit the, uh, the way I like to play the game too well. Um, but... Uh, So I, I was just playing for fun, but all that did prepare me for uh, more recently when I actually started playing Team 17 competitively. Yeah, it's like you're really good at Team 17, and you oh, yeah, clearly and have all these a, skills. <laughs> and I used to play a lot more um, variety of schemes, which, which I also feel prepared me for Team 17. And some... Um, yeah, Team 17 has undergone a, sort of a, a revolution. Everyone's playing, like, Island Team 17. It used to be everybody played um, mm. these double cavern maps that have, like, you have an upper area, you have a lower area. And that's what pretty much all the league games were, were played on. 
But now we have maps like this, which are nice. Um, and a little more chaotic, maybe, but there's more options for, like, parachuting around and getting to all parts of the map. Yeah, so I, I suppose while you two are concentrating, I'll need to ask the questions. Um, yeah. I so I, I was thinking that... Um, I, I, I mean, talk about certain strategies that don't give away anything. I was um, thinking Dangling Pointer might might be able mm -hmm. to make it to the crate, but probably not. No, he, when he jumped onto that pencil, he almost certainly not be able to make it onto the tip of the pencil. So, so yeah, what should Out I of do? Out had the worst position, mm -hmm. um, let, let really no access to anything, so he is the one I teleported. That makes sense. Um, I'm just doing this. Might as well. Oh, I could avoid revealing that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I am typing that into my text file, so I know you have <laughs> one other thing. <laughs> so, Dead Code, what do you personally feel is the most skillful part of Worms Armageddon? <laughs> oh, jeez. Can we have uh, your, your biased and then unbiased opinion? <laughs> oh, um... Oh man, that's such a complicated question. How could I possibly? Um, oh dear. Oh, I forgot. I, uh, oh, I. So this is not going to be too serious of a game because Discord gives me micro lags. But uh, yeah, don't the only way it. I could chat on the stream. So yeah, I might screw up some turns because of the micro lags. Um, which thing is the most skillful part? Oh my god. Um, well, you know, I think probably the strategy, because learning the uh, how to fire the weapons and all that stuff, I mean, at least in my case, that's the kind of stuff that I got good at earlier, and the strategy took me years more. Yeah, I think it's like everyone starts at different places and like Yeah. Like I started as a pure roper. Like I didn't know anything about strategy. And uh, after maybe a couple years of playing, I started to play like elite and some schemes like that. And it's like it, it, I guess the cool thing about worms it taught me that I can be a, a strategic player. Like I was never good at chess or anything, but like What's cool about this game is it can like it can like teach you what you're good at and there's lots of things that you can attempt. And uh Yeah, the most skillful part though, it's like as a sandbox game, you know, like that's difficult for anyone to answer. It's like roping is extremely skillful, super cheap. So I think I want to deny you the top. This okay. is not gonna do too much damage, but um, yeah, it'll deny you to the top, and I think in the long run that might be more important. Yeah, I made this worm so that he could have nice access. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'll ask a couple of the questions in the chat. Uh, Charles was first, so thoughts on Tassin for front end so far for completely. Tassin, Worms Armageddon, all missions. Oh, um, yeah. So that's actually, there's a very complicated answer to that. Um, so all of the tasks are currently for a variety of different uh, logic versions. And uh, the thing about that is um, I accidentally changed some things about the way missions work when I, I didn't really mean to, I mean, I wasn't focused on the effect that the, the effect that the things that I did had on missions. I was thinking about the bigger picture, but um, I ended up changing some things about like where, where, uh, Crates 
up here on the first turn and what the wind is on the first turn and things like that, which actually have a, a big effect on, oh dear, damn it. Well, that does, oh, hmm. Okay, that's not so good. Missed a grenade toss there. Um, yeah, so I have done a lot of the work already on uh, undoing some of those changes. So to, to move the, uh, the way the missions work back to how it used to be. Now, and another big one is the, the way that CPU worms determine where to go. And one of the changes I did accidentally resulted in the the worms having a huge bias in which direction they move. They almost never move in a certain direction. They always move in the other direction. Right, right. Yeah, we, we use that to our advantage in deathmatch at the moment. But um, yeah, not the intended. But it's not original. the it's not the way that the missions were originally developed and um, intended to be played. So um, the first step in doing a task of all missions um, that's continuous is to get the same logic version throughout the entire run, which means I want to, that to be a good logic version, one that makes sense and not the way things currently work. And that might happen, I, I, I'd like to have that be the case in the next release. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I might just take a would... big chance here and um, let's see. Oh, you know what? I'm actually blocking the passage here so I can just do this. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. Uh, actually, that's would be a really easy to feature to add. And um, yeah, I think I will just do that. Add a scheme option that um, lets you teleport all your worms at once. Yeah, that would be extremely easy, and it would be very helpful. I should have done that um, a while ago, actually. I just had the oh. audio off for myself, but we could hear dead code. I was basically just asking Triad's question about manual worm placement. Um, so yeah, next up from Chicken Two Three, uh, he asks Dead Code, "Who is your oh. biggest rival in Island Team Seventeen? Evil Devil emoji face." <laughs> That's kind of changed. Um, um, yeah, that might that currently might be uh, Korean Red Dragon because. Ooh. He like, he beat me a whole bunch of times in a row, but then I came back and beat him a whole bunch of times in a row. But uh, I remember those matches. Yeah, but who knows who would win next? Um, the game and, is uh, constantly evolving. <laughs> I, I mean, well, Vesuvio was really good. He was very hard to beat, but he's become inactive. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, he's good. He played a lot of intermediate um, in the day. I know a lot of people uh, don't really remember him for this, but Vesuvio was, in my opinion, one of the best warmer players of that era as well. He, he, he had he had the nicest, he had one of the nicest styles of kicks I've ever seen, like triple kick, triple kick, triple kick. Oh, it was so nice. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was a good roper. Um. So moving on, um, Dead Code, what is your favorite tool assisted run that you've created? <laughs> oh, a lot of um, I, I think it's probably got to be one of the missions because those are, there's some really, uh, but. Being in a game, I can't really answer which one. There was some of them I did some elaborate things. Like one of the most recent ones, I took some ideas from uh, Mablack for that uh, the one where the water is rising and it's a submarine 
thing. Yeah, who let the floodgates uh, open? Yeah, I think it's that. Yeah, um, and that's got some CP worms that teleport sometimes. I randomness manipulated one to teleport right next to me so I could kill it. Um, <laughs> yeah, did some other tricks in that. That was really cool. I remember that one. Um, and like I tried to make it so that even in the human version of that, that you could get that teleport. And like, I sort of achieved it like once, but then I realized nah. this is like too hard because you have to execute like Sorry. a bunch of turns in a row, like the same way. My black, that's not fair for you to say the human version because you're just not human. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's right AI there is uh, the macro lag um, causing me to miss a shoot. Oh, yeah. And, um, I just had Mac Relog again. Uh, okay. Oh, right. Neither of us can really multitask. It's hard to con it's hard to talk while playing this. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of my favorite TA, uh, another one was, uh, oh, and that's not the retreat I wanted actually, but, um, I should have gone down, but um, another one of my favorites is one that took a lot of uh, well, that took like four days to make. I think um, thousands of undoes. It was a, a roping one, but not standard roping. It was a challenge oh. where uh, you can only fire two ropes and. Um, yeah, you, you can only fire two ropes per turn, and I think something else that you do costs five seconds, but uh, that one turned out to be really interesting. Yeah, I think, like, from your challenge, it, I mean, like, I really appreciate the mission stuff. A TCB challenge. Sure. I should have said, yeah, it's a TCB oh. challenge. Do I remember that? I'm trying to remember. I'm not sure if I remember that or not. Hmm, do I want um, that crate? Uh, hmm. So, yeah. Um, I think what? I'm going to deny another worm from having access <laughs> by using another one of my things right now. So, Dead Code, what is your favorite scheme and has it changed over the years? I think I, I figured out that Team 17 was my favorite really early on, but for a long time I still played a lot of battle races, and that used to be definitely one of my favorites. Um, but I, I don't play it anymore. Uh, is it because you've played all the good maps? <laughs> <laughs> eh, well, that could be part of it. Um, Oh, that doesn't actually deny you anything. <laughs> what was I thinking? A lot of damage. Uh, Spicy weapon, though. It's actually um, interesting here to hear, actually hear the reactions from you guys when you pick up certain weapons. It's kind <laughs> of like playing poker in a way. If you're carefully listening to like the little gasps of breath and stuff, it's <laughs> interesting. Because it's like Tom says, or AKA Chicken Two Free. Um, Team 17 is kind of similar to poker. You, you need to do a lot of bluffing and sort of... It, it's, it, it's nice to know the player when you, who you're playing against. But yeah, yeah. Um, so... I really think that um, the fact that I love battle race is reflected in my love of Team 17 because traversal of the map is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it has the added dimension of, of parachute with a different wind every turn. Was, uh, that oh, was a really double good. pet. That turn. was nice. That's devastating. Yeah, a double <laughs> pet. That was really nice. Oh, thanks. You don't see a double pet very often. So I was saying, what force, would I do in chaos? Forces me to move one of these unless I. Yeah, I think I'll just um, get a crate that doesn't put me in danger. Yeah, these crates are weird. Like all, like we keep getting this one in the lower right. Like, why does that keep? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, um, so 
Has Island Team 17 rekindled your passion for the game? As a player, oh, I imagine. It's not, it's not a rekindling because I... Um, You've never not been. I never thought of Island Team 17 as something different. Um, that was actually a, something that I, I think happened during a time when I was less active that people decided mm -hmm. Dual Cavern was the way Team 17 had to be. Uh, okay. Because when I back when I was playing it, it was just taken for granted that you played it on all sorts of maps, including Island, a lot of the time. Now you've just freed Memory Leak. Oh, true. yeah. I'm not thinking about rope so much. <laughs> now the micro lag may screw me up in this, but I think now is the time for a rope turn. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I. I don't think I remember, like, old days playing on, like, Island Team 17 maps. But, I mean, we looked at some old replays, and, in fact, the uh, the archaeological records show, uh, yes, people played on all kinds of maps oh, no. back in the day. And, yeah, honestly, like, more schemes could benefit from that, like, just having a, a wide variety of map styles. Mm. But it, it's also true, it takes a lot of skill and time to get good at any particular map style. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so exactly like, like you say there, because it's like, if you're a really good first-person shooter, for example, it, even if you go into a game, even if you're the best in the world at another game, you go into another game and you're kind of like average, because it's most important to know the environment you're playing in, to memorize the map, to memorize how people play the map, to memorize who does what and what spots, etc. And that's that that is what takes you to the next level or the top tier of any video game is not just having the mechanical skills, but memorizing the maps and environment you're playing as well. So absolutely understand that one, yeah. But um, in terms of rekindling, um, I would say that playing competitively rekindled my interest in a way um mm -hmm. it it made the experience of playing it added a new dimension to it it um made me have a higher incentive to improve my uh improve my my play and it's probably it might be unusual that somebody made that switch so late from just playing funners to actually how yeah, common is, is that <laughs> It, it is. Oh, that was unlucky. You almost got that. I mean, I, um, I, I constantly switch between playing seriously and playing funners and stuff. Um, there are other players that do that as well. I'm, I am personally more interested in creating a competitive, a healthy competitive environment for as many players to compete as possible. And, um. Th th this is not me taking credit because it's a team effort, one hundred percent. But thanks to the streaming on this channel with the help of others, that alone has brought back quite a few older players. Like when Dario and Chuvash came back, Ma Black started playing seriously himself as well. Chicken 2 Free came back, Korean Red Dragon came back. And that, seeing certain really good, it's like a snowball effect, the butterfly effect. The more people that are just having fun playing top tier games against other top tier players while seeing it streamed and seeing their achievements and their wins as well as their downs and that it pushes them even further because they know people are watching and it's re it's just a nice feeling to be good at what you do and impress people and see that your your wins and your victories are not they don't just fade into the past. They're recorded. People can celebrate them. You see, the bet. that's why we're doing this podcast, doing the competitive showcase in the league news at the start of every episode to celebrate all the great players and their achievements. And over time, that will just keep building up and building up. And I, I, I strongly believe that this whole thing we've been doing since 2020 when I started streaming CWT, it's getting better and better, and I strongly believe that 
that that Twitch and streaming has played a huge part in in grabbing back some of that lost interest and activity that the game used to have. And like we said earlier, and um, when I said during the B and G tutorial, this has been the most active season for TUS singles since season one of the new era, and it's just continuing to grow. We're seeing more and more new players, old players, come back and new players who are getting really good at the game because of all the the tutorials and the information and good players to play against so we're, we're sort of in a a new sort of era again getting all this back and it's an absolute privilege and honor to be a part of that yeah it's like i would love it if just like we had i think like the game itself has always been like active off and on like just for its whole lifespan um i would love to get back to more like you know the original uh level of activity i think maybe we could get there one day but um yeah. i do feel like you know dead code is definitely keeping the game alive with like oh, updates yeah. and stuff and we do get a good influx of people anytime there's like a new update um so i, I don't know i hope that I hope that just uh, continues because that would be really cool. Yeah. So on to uh, the next question for Dead Code. What was your favorite era of Worms Armageddon in terms of leagues? Um, Wackle, mm -hmm. CL2K, First Blood, TUS, or any of the others that haven't been mentioned? Well, so I mean, I didn't take part in any of them except until two, TUS. I mean, um, well, there was a short-lived one called Worms League that I oh, did yeah. before that. But uh, so I would have a sort of a different perspective on it. Um, it's yeah, not about like the leagues, really, but in, term, in terms of watching other people play the leagues. And um, I mean, each one has a different feeling in my mind for that. Um, I mean, hmm. I don't know how to answer the, that really. Uh, no problem, no rush, take your that, time. And also, there was the way that like, file sharing and all those things worked on all the previous sites as well. I mean, I, I miss, I, I really miss uh, the ones that are gone. Like, um, um, Name the pixel, and I think the, oh well, that was great. That had a file system t on it too, and um, that was like where everyone was basically getting like that was where we got maps. That was where we got like everything. Uh, um, and of course, I missed the uh, Team Seventeen forum. I did a lot of communication there, and uh, there is uh, an archive of some of that, but it's mostly incomplete. Mm. I had a lot of fun uh, going over the archive of, of First Blood replays to find bugs. I, I did a, a massive uh, project of, of going over the re those replays and finding bugs I didn't know about and um, trying to figure out why certain things happen. Um, and I, I did the same thing with TUS replays to find um, rubber were related bugs okay that's wow uh so that's a, a late freeze there oh my god I w um, yeah like i wanted to do it at sudden death but i couldn't <laughs> <laughs> well, i think i just need to block yazel um for now because yargington has that and well shard attack they have access but they're they're weaker but well i can't damage i don't have petrol so i think i just have to now, if I do a block like this, it'll also help me to get up. Because this backflip here is kind of tricky. I, um, so I'm going to make that easier. Oh, but uh, I think I want to also let me, Well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just do this. So, yeah, Dead Code. Um, what is your favorite Worms achievement? <laughs> I guess we could say like you're, it could be either your like 
like playing or you no, know i mean i think it has to be working on the game rather than playing sure, sure. it uh but um i mean i've already talked about things that i would say my favorite i could um mention something new like uh well some of the marathon projects were really fun but those don't get talked about too much um I already talked about the, the Animal Marathon project, but there was another one. I remember how I said that there were uh, a year of network logs that were in a different format that was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So it, I spent, um, well, I offhand, I don't remember now if it was three weeks or three months. I think it was three months um, working on a disambiguation system for those recordings so they could be turned into replay files. So I could. Um, watch the first year of my recorded games. Oh my god. Fun, fun project. It's like it's like you and put in these this like Herculean amount of effort to like accomplish all these things. I I feel like most people would not be able to do that. Like just to like to get the vectorized sprites, like <laughs> to do all these things. Um but it shows. It it comes across in the the updates <laughs> that you put in all this time. So welcome um, everybody raiding from Dream Trance's channel. I believe they had some chaos league going on. So welcome. This is the second episode of the competitive Worms Armageddon podcast featuring the legendary dead code. We did start uh. at 7 p.m. <laughs> GMT. The interview started at. 8 p.m. GMT, so there's a lot of awesome things, Yay! and you can Got watch it, it on the oh, VOD later. Very nice shot there. Thank you. <laughs> it's very rare that you... Oh, I didn't kill one of them. Um, it's very rare that you get to do a bungee drop that you can get up from. You actually drop a weapon from bungee. It's not that, tough. And yeah, that's like... That's some high skill stuff. Talking and that's about also one of the one of the worst weapons uh, to use against me there. I mean, one of the best weapons to use against me. You know what I mean. <laughs> for me, for me, like, answering that question, the most impressive thing, I would say biased ninja rope. Unbiased bungee rope. Because the bungee rope is just, the, the, the timing is even more ridiculous than ninja rope. Because ninja rope is a little bit, how can I explain it? It, it? You you've got more wiggle room when you do a bounce and retract it. It goes really really fast, and so yeah. But anyway, um, so I'm surprised that you're not attacking how to balance. So. I can't. Really, oh, I just I'm having trouble thinking while talking. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So just like okay, get free. Okay. Um, Dead Code, what do you love most about playing Worms Armageddon competitively, and what keeps you motivated to continue competing? Oh, well, what I love most is um, I get to play against really good players more often than I otherwise would. And, uh, and that, I mean, that gets both of us to improve, both who I'm playing against and me. And uh, just going up and uh bringing the bringing our in, <clears throat> um collective skill experience level. of the game higher and heights higher right yeah because it's yeah. like just taking it to the next level yay oh dude i can't I believe wow. that very, very i totally nice. did not dude thank you <laughs> guys guys he used ta he used ta <laughs> That was uh, that was incredibly good. Um, Thanks. Like doing a drop like that is. Uh, was that a deliberate plot? I mean, was that? Oh no! Don't! I totally did not expect the plot oh, there. I, right, yeah. I thought something good would happen, but uh, I didn't expect that plot. Yes. So. Maybe you get scales of justice in this next crate? No. Right, so this is the last question we have written down. Um, oh boy. 
Oh Out of bounds is going to get pushed. Mark my words. <laughs> He's so, going to get a slight push. Looking ahead. You have, to, you have to kill both my worms here, otherwise. Looking ahead, what are your goals and aspirations for worms in general? Can oh, worms Armageddon become an <laughs> eSport? I'm surprised you didn't shoot that, that up. I, I really would like, I mean, it's such an, an excellent game um, that more people should be playing it for sure. Mm. And uh, so any, like every improvement that I can do uh, we'll probably work towards that goal, but uh, well, making the online play features work better is um, probably a big part of that. But yeah, why are not more people playing it? I don't really understand that. It's, 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 it's something it's the that best we game ever. It's something we explain quite a lot. Worms Armageddon. If you don't actually play it and understand the depth, it just looks like a casual, whack, casual, wacky game that you play at the weekend while you're drinking with your buddies. It, in order to understand how impressive it is to do ninja rope, to do bungee rope, to do pixel perfect placements, memorize all the weapons, be really good. It's, it's one of these things that a lot of people don't understand how precise and awesome this game is. So we're just going to do one more thing, which is a quick time trial rope race between these two guys. Don't worry if you can't play exactly. Um, it's just what um, the people yeah, want the to see. Yeah, the micro leg is going to be a problem there. I think I have to... Uh, I'm going to try switching uh, my Discord chat to browser. I think I can do that. If it if it doesn't work right away, <laughs> I'll switch back. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. I think a lot of people, like, play the game and then, you know, it's like... There, there's so many like streamers I see playing Worms Armageddon. I would think that more people would like be clued into it, but I think usually when those streamers play it, they play it like it's a, you know, it's a it's a '90s party game, like so it's like people are seeing it played, but they're almost never seeing it like be played competitively. That's kind of the that could be part of it. Like it kind of feels like it's still getting exposure as a game. But um, it's it's not the kind of exposure that lends to people like <laughs> playing it, I guess. Like seriously. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Perfect. Is that better? Excellent. I won't have the micro lag now. Right. Uh, KRD host host a more open map. Do like a bon hurt. A bon oh, hurt sure. would be hey. nice. <laughs> KRD forgot he was hosting, that's no problem. <laughs> what I can do temporary is just do that to make that bigger just now, and then I can do that um when we're ready to go, just so you can sort of see that a bit better. Right, um, question. Why did so many of us think this stream was happening last Sunday? Um, I don't have any idea. I maybe don't. because <laughs> maybe because the last episode was on the Sunday, but because of different schedules for everybody, the plan is that we are going to have each episode on the last weekend of each month so it's going to be the friday the saturday or the sunday and it will alternate between whatever is best for the myself my black and whoever it is that we get on for the the interview so you can you can yeah. sort of get it you can rely on it being the last weekend of the month and any time from 7 gmt onwards because uh, my black is American, so that makes it easier for him um, to wake up and stuff, you know what I mean? Oh uh, yeah, time zones. Right, so we will be wrapping up the stream after this TTRR, so if you have any questions for Dead Code, then this is your last chance to ask them. Because this will only take 5-10 minutes. 
you will never be able to contact Dead Code again after this. He That's will it. disappear. <laughs> He's going to be locked up in the basement again, working on Worms Armageddon future patches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, question. Um... I think we've already covered that. Uh, there's obviously not an exact date, I think, but Dream Trance is asking, when is 3.9 getting released? Yeah, I, I can't give a solid date on that. I mean, it's um, very likely sometime this year. That's, that's all I'll say. I mean, I, I will be playing this game for the rest of my life, so I'm not in a rush. So, question. Have you thought about making a blog about developers' thoughts? Uh, I mean, we actually had one, but I didn't really use it because, honestly, I think that um, taking the time to write posts that are that satisfy my level of perfectionism would make the whole development process take a lot longer. Yeah. I feel like that something like that could be fun if you're like if you really want to like get your your ideas out there but that would take like extra time you know <laughs> like i don't know it's like i could be using this time to code mm. i'm writing about the fact that i'm coding <laughs> so i'm going to ask uh, another question myself for dead code just because i'm curious but i'll wait until he finishes his turn So yeah, I hope you've all enjoyed the stream. It's been... I have had an absolute blast. Did KRD hear the word Bonhart? Bonhart? <laughs> Bonhart? Ah. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, I should have actually typed it in. I can't remember if I did or whatever. We'll have to recruit someone to write the blog. Cody and not Coden. <laughs> so yeah, um... Dead code. We asked what was your favorite scheme. What is the scheme that you hate the most? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Won't say chaos. Oh, oh geez. I've I've honestly never thought about it in those terms. Um hmm. Oh man. Um <laughs> How about this? How which one do you like? The, do you I, like I, these? So I, there's various schemes that I hate in different ways. How could I say which one I hate the most? <laughs> Can I just talk about what I hate about? <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. Answer it however you want, however you interpret it. Yeah, we need honesty here. Yeah. Brutal, chaotic honesty. So what I hate about um, Mole Shopper is that. The map always looks pretty much the same. Oh yeah. It's you don't feel the, the uh, variety. Like I mean, I'm, you can get variety in the microscopic details of how the tunnel system works out, but it doesn't feel different. And it's the like... other thing I hate about it is <laughs> the scheme that's popular these days is uh, has super overpowered weapons, and I don't like that. And then about <laughs> chaos, there's a lot of things that I actually that I like about it. But most of it is um, in theory, because in practice, it just doesn't really fit. Oh, my God. There you go. So that's what you get for having me talk and play at the same time. But um, yeah. <laughs> uh, It's funny. Yes. Um, I'm more of a, a slow, strategic player. And in chaos, the situation changes so fast Yeah. that you can't it's, really plan. Yeah. And then the other I sort thing I hate is the sto snowballing of the uh, oh, the stockpiling yeah. system. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it ends up often snowballing who wins. It does. It does. It's hard to come back. You got to really like step back and like collect if you want to get yourself back in the game. Sometimes. Yeah, and that doesn't feel like a natural way of playing. I I mean, when I was playing Chaos, uh, a thing that happened often is that. The, the opponent would seem to be doing poorly, and I'd, I'd seem to be getting a, a leg up over them, and then suddenly they'd all re unleash their huge arsenal upon me. Maybe even after waiting, yeah. letting themselves be defeated once. And that, oh, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, it's a valid thing. Like, you just kind of collect, I, like, you know you're going to lose, so you just collect and build up. 
I don't feel Eric. that it would be fun for me to, to <laughs> use that tactic over other players. It's just funny right. how it. whenever I ask someone what's the scheme you hate the most or what you dislike the most, Mole Shopper <laughs> has always got a special <laughs> play. It's like if you've ever had a bad day, like you, you feel like you've hit rock bottom in life and you need something to cheer you up, just remember there are people out there who actually enjoy Mole Shopper and be <laughs> grateful you're not one of them. <laughs> I have a lot of respect for them. I mean, if yeah. they, uh... it, is a very, it is a very skillful um scheme and when when there was that whole drama on tus forums i was like the one person who was saying no but it is actually really really skillful and zalo is actually an incredibly skillful player um but yeah it's just one of those things we like making fun of <laughs> mm -hmm. oh cool we get we get a backwards run of the map that's always Ooh. good inflex Ooh. Oh, good. Damn it. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, inflexes are fun. Um, yeah, Mole Shopper, like, I'll acknowledge, it takes strategy. I, I've never really gotten that into it, but, um, yeah, it's, it's the same map every time, which is different holes. Uh, I do love Chaos, though. I think it's partly the gambling aspect of it. It's like you can, ah, you will. always feel like you can like get a good arsenal. Even like you always feel like you have a chance. Uh, and I feel like I keep getting. I feel like there's just a large headroom for like improving at chaos, which is really fun. Yeah, that's but, a, um, that's a like, very yeah, good like, question. Is, that's a very good question yeah. from Triad here for dead code um what could we do individually and as a community to reach new potential players oh billboards well i mean having uh maybe even things like having a better matchmaking system having a matchmaking system um and other online play features that bring it up to more like what modern games are like. That might that might help. I, like I also feel like one of the most but off putting things individuals can do in terms of what individuals can do. I think just spread the word of how good a game it is. Yeah. And, it's like, um, it's like I mean, do streams. Do streams to show people who don't have the game how good it is. It's like that episode of South Park where it's like, I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I get what you mean. Yeah. Like, what was I going to say there? Um, in terms of reaching new play Yeah, one of the things I believe is really off-putting for newcomers and beginners is the game has no internal guide and unless you meet somebody oh, yeah. that shares information with you you've got no idea of the depth of the game so you go online you play the game with your friends you think oh this is pretty fun i'll go online and then q q sharks video oh i'm a noob oh yes yeah. i am yeah. <laughs> you just get kicked it's oh, like so, i mean in terms of that it might help to have an automated um tutorial system yeah i don't know or even something in the cool. options that, that's got a guide built by the community for the community somehow and get a pool of it what what everybody thinks is the most important things to learn or the most useful things to learn and basically summarize it as best as possible and just give people links that if you find this interesting, visit here, and you can have the hardcore nerdy version of it, basically. In terms of my own experience, um, one of the uh, most important things that people have to learn to play Team 17 at an entry level is uh, use of the parachute. And especially the, uh, the backwards parachute climb. Yeah. And I mean, it's something that is not not intuitive for a lot of uh, I, newbies. Yeah, I agree. It's like you could have, honestly, you could have like an obstacle course, like with like parachute from this point to this point. There's a lot of like 
tutorial kind of stuff that would be great like if it came with you know like a, a map and a challenge or something so the yeah. um the stuff that dream trance has said there is literally the things that i and a few others are actually doing we sh at the beginning of ev at the beginning of every podcast we have about 25 minutes of league or competitive news from TUS, Chaos League, ONL, Cups, Challenges, Tournaments, anything that's there. Um, also, uh, what was the other thing you said? Invitational tournaments with money prizes. That's something that I've done as well. Right now, I am putting minimum £800 of my own money per year into events right now. So every two months... There's a TL, TRL season with a £100 cash prize, 75 for the winner, 25 for runner-up. And every three months, there is a something of something tournament. So we've had Academy of Artillery. Now we've got Renaissance of Roping. We're also going to have School of Strategy. And we're also going to have Masters of Mechanics. And that's going to take place every year. And those have like a £60 prize pool from my own money. And usually you get donations as well, like with the last Academy of Artillery, the Walrus donated, equaled my donation as well. And I think he even put like an extra £10 or something. So we are definitely... That's awesome. And, and the Chaos League as well, um, Dream Trance puts in quite a generous sum of money for winning that as well. But I think the seasons for that are a bit longer than two... I actually don't know. How long are the seasons, Mad Black? For, for wait, for TRL? No, Chaos League. Cause <laughs> Chaos I, I, League. Honest, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's just said it there. Trans can answer that. It, it, six to seven months. Yeah, it's like yeah. long, long time. We're all playing each other twice. Yeah. Yeah, that's the question, though. I think we all do triads. Speaking of spreading the word, I sound like an evangelical yeah. lunatic when I start to rave about worms I'm getting to my friends. When I try telling my friends, they're just like, you still play that childish cartoony game? I thought right. you would have oh. grown out that. It's like, what? It's like, you've got <sighs> no idea. Like, see, for example, I, I, I've i got literally yeah. over 100,000 hours in video gaming. About 50,000 of those hours is Worms Armageddon alone, right? That, that also mm -hmm. includes... That also, that's not just 50,000 hours of gameplay. It's mostly gameplay, but the other time is like forums, creating schemes, creating maps, talking about things, streaming things, watching people play... And so that all goes towards actual playing as well. Now, it's like a lot of people just do not understand how high a skill ceiling this is. Like, it took me much longer to master Ninja Rope and B&G and other things than any other game I've ever played, you know? Like, also, like, I've found, like, I've tried to explain it to friends before. Like, you know I've been playing this for, like, 20 years I f it's super skillful. I only I only keep getting better. It's like an insanely skillful game, but yeah. they still think of it as a party game. It's like I I can't break through to certain huh. people. Yeah. Like they're just not going to play huh. it. But I mean, some people get it. But uh, yeah, that's a shame. I don't. Know. Really, is. <laughs> I think. I mean, like I think a lot of people who see streams and like see speed runs and see stuff like that, they they understand. They see like, oh wow, this is amazing. Like at some of the um. I get some of the GDQ things that like Ruffle Bricks has done that I've done. Like you'll you'll see people in the chat being like, "Whoa, I didn't know worms could be played this way." Um, I don't know if those people come go on to like start playing the game, but some of this, I think some of them do. Um, although a lot of times it's they still just think of it as like, "Oh, it's this old game." But we do try to remind everybody like this game is super well maintained thanks to Dead Code, and it's um super cheap on steam so i don't know i think like you know we get more updates uh thing i feel like things can happen to keep the community uh going yeah. and uh i think one thing is like we're always going to be here like <laughs> we're always going to be at least playing the game to some extent so well for me uh, for, for for me personally chicken so chicken saying i know we are biased but is worms one of the most skillful games ever to me it is the most skillful game ever not League of Legends, not World of Warcraft, not Monster Hunter, Dark Souls. They are all 
piss easy in comparison, <laughs> in my opinion. Even speedrunning things like 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 Super Mario Brothers, you see people streaming that, and I'm like, that is so easy compared to like roping because like you need to get yeah. a frame perfect thing once every couple of minutes or something. Whereas in Ninja Roping, it is nigh impossible to reach speedrunning tool assisted levels. We are not even like twenty percent close to perfecting that. And when you're ninja open, you need to get a frame perfect touch with your fingers and your space bar like yeah. parallel to each other literally every fucking second or multiple times a second. It's another it's it's the oh I can't and then bungee rope is even more insane than that. Like it's it's incredible. I, I cannot Rocket League was easy. I managed to get into the champion <laughs> champion two rank <laughs> in like four hundred hours of Rocket League. Hmm. And people, people, at that at that point in time, people were saying it takes an average of two thousand hours to do. But to be fair, I did have quite a lot of experience with flight simulators, so I was good at pitch yawn roll and driving games and like I'm I'm just good at gaming to be honest. But yeah. Yeah. You know, I've seen that. <laughs> Like, but but here yeah. here's the thing that's most important, right? It might not be, not it might not be the most individually impressive thing in the world, but the combination of all the classic schemes that Worms has, all that together, there's like, pfft, there's I cannot think of anything that compares, and I would love somebody to come up and say. This is even this is even more challenging because I'd be like, I'd be all over that. I would want to experience that, you know. That's why I keep playing Worms Armageddon because it's the most it's the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, uh, like, yeah. it, it really is. It's, yeah, mentally and physically, you know, because you've got you've got yeah. physical skills and you've got mental skills. You know what I mean? It's got a combination of all those. It's it's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, taken all together, like getting good at like all the different nah, games. Dream tra Definitely. sorry, Dream it's Trance. Like, I disagree. Like, I could not disagree more. Like, games like Tekken are piss easy compared to playing Worms, in my opinion. <laughs> Roping alone, but anyway, <laughs> being biased here yeah. and unbiased. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, like if we consider that there's like an infinite number of schemes we could have, you could really like spend your whole life getting good at Worms. It's um just infinite number of like game types so i mean it's yeah that's why we're here <laughs> is dead code still here or is he left oh yeah i just oh, haven't right. had anything to add for a few minutes yeah um yeah. so if any if anybody has any more questions you're gonna have to ask now because we're gonna wrap this up but first of all i would like to Thank Dead Code for giving us his time. It's been an absolute yeah. privilege and an honor to have you here. You are majorly responsible for not just one of my best games that I've ever experienced in my life, but some of my favorite memories from my entire life have been playing this game with some of the most fascinating people I've ever seen. And it's hearing you speak about everything as passionately as you do and You've got one of the most fascinating minds that I've seen when it comes to developing games and how passionate you are and the extent that you go to, like, doing 5,000 to 10,000 attempts at even to assist. That's crazy. It's, it's amazing. So thank you very much. And, yeah, it's been an honor. Thank um, you. It's It's been an honor to um, have... This interview, um, thank you for running such a um, such a nice what's, stream. It's, um, what's great is we can like and, do a clickbait headline: "Dead Code Reveals Major Update News," uh, <laughs> like for three point nine or something. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks for being here. Yeah, this was this is great. Um, I feel like there's even more we could talk about too. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, there's I could talk lot. about this game forever. So yeah. We all but, could. Yeah, that was very informative, and yeah, I'm. I don't know. I, I'm ready to wrap it up, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. Um, also, thank you, Mad Black, for all the effort you put into your tutorials, and yeah, yeah being yeah, a cool. part of this project we have together, and 
almost more importantly, thank you to everybody who is interested in this stuff, comes and supports the channel, and also thank you to all the amazing players that we had featured on today's episode and all past and future episodes as well. It's because of you that this is possible and is even enjoyable to do. It's inspirational, it's influential, and yeah, we keep doing it, and it's only going to get better. Yeah, we got more more interviews in store. I'm not sure who we're doing next. We'll figure it and out. Thank you to everybody who continues to play the game and enjoy it. And um, yeah, hmm. and uh, yeah, uh, we just call it good there. It's like it's like we're it's like we're so happy right now. We just don't want to leave, but we have to. Just, All yeah. good things must come to an end. So, with that being said, again and a million times over, and for everything else you will provide for us, thank you from the bottom of my heart, Dead Code. It's really appreciated. And if you ever need any support in anything, you've got all of us here who will help you. Awesome. So yeah, with yeah, that nice. with that in store, it is Friday night or Friday evening for some folks. So I hope you all have a great night and you all have a great weekend. And we will see you all again uh, the next month on the last weekend of April for episode three. And um, we haven't got the next person decided yet, but there are a few people interested. So that will be posted on the discord as soon as we find out so if you want to keep up to date with all the competitive events and news about podcasts you can join the the discord server there and yeah keep up to date so yeah take care everybody and bye all right peace out y'all